we, we just went live, Nick. We're, we're live on YouTube. You know this thing called YouTube, Nick? You you're, you're familiar with it? It's just a streaming platform. You put content on it. People tune Big in from anywhere in the world. Huge. I didn't know we were going live today, to be honest with you. I thought this was just going to be a recorded show, but I'm glad to be live. That's when I'm, that's when I'm in my element. Oh, we're, we're live, but we're not going to actually take questions. Fuck that. We have our own questions. I have a show sheet. I didn't slave away at the show sheet for hours just to take questions from the audience. You know what we'll do? This is what we'll do. We'll take one question. One question at the end. We'll take one question at the end from the audience. We always got to give the stream something. You can't give them nothing. You got to give them so you can respect the stream. We learned that from Austin Eckler. Right? We were disrespecting the stream. Now we are neutral. We're stream neutral. We're not necessarily kissing the stream's ass. That's not going to happen. That's not the Podfather style. But, you know, we do acknowledge the stream. We do put some some clever uh, comments up on the board, up on the display when they come in once in a while. And we, we will take a question or two at the end. How about that? It's a good compromise. It's fine with me. I mean, to be fair, like, logistically... Um combining the show sheet with additional questions, we could be here until like the NFL draft. That's right. That's right. So having you on is a great opportunity because you're one of the best content creators in all of you know football, really, not just fantasy football. You go to YouTube and your channel, uh, Big Dogs Got to Eat, B-D-G-E, is one of the best out there and i learned a lot just watching your videos seeing your style and 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 how you're producing the content what you're talking about it's awesome it's awesome so can we just start with a little bit about you and your channel and your brand success because in the last couple of years i mean it's been a rocket ship yeah um i mean similar to you it's it's not something that has come overnight whatsoever. It's a compiling, compounding uh, effect that I just contribute a lot of hard work to, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, a lot dude, of beers you work hard, dude. along the way. Dude, we all do. Every a lot of people in the industry work hard. Some people, you know, don't don't work as smart as others, and I think that's probably a differentiator uh, to a degree. But I don't, you know, I just don't some think of your thumbnails. I'm like, this dude's working, dude. I've been, I've been work. I have been working really hard on the thumbnails. We've been transitioning over, or I've been transitioning over way more to like the meme type of of content when it comes to the thumbnails because I've noticed, uh, basically every YouTube thumbnail in the football space in the fantasy football space literally looks exactly the same. So one thing I like to do as a creator is. When you have a piece of content that's outwardly displayed, right, whether it's a blog post or a YouTube thumbnail, whatever it is, like do yourself a service by covering up whatever the, the author's name is, your own name on it. If you go to your website and you covered up what was on there, like the logo or whatever, and once you do that, you couldn't objectively recognize where that piece of content came from. If you just wrote a blog post and it looks like every single other person's blog post, you need to rethink where you're headed creatively. And I just started to see every channel on YouTube dishing out the exact same titles with the exact same thumbnails with this. And I'm like, like everything else in the world, this will become commoditized and that's not a way to separate yourself. So I'm like, I want to start moving more towards like a fun content, more content creation style than anything to do with like fantasy sports or football. Right. And I'm like, we're bringing people onto the team and talking to new people. And I'm like, all right, forget everything that you fucking know about creating and forget everything you know about football and sports media in general. We want to start looking at the dudes like Mr. Beast and we want to start looking at the YouTube content creators that are creating content because that's that's how I want us as a brand to be looked at. Like every time you come to one of my videos, I'm like, oh, I'm about to get like a very cool video. I'm, I'm about to get a film that they worked hard on to make sure it was separated and differentiated. So I want to take inspiration from other content creators that are not in our space and take what we can learn from them and transfer it over to what we're doing because I think if you look at other industries and uh, uh you know anything outside of what we're doing 
you'll see a lot of successful, whether they're tactics or uh, strategies that aren't being implemented within hours, and they easily could be. They're successful elsewhere. There's no reason they wouldn't be uh, in what we're doing. And in that, you could differentiate yourself because no one else is doing it. So we've always tried to um, – differentiate by looking at ourselves as more again of like a media company a content creation company and just being putting out there whatever whatever it is we're actually passionate about personally so we'll start creating content about fucking tech or fitness or nutrition or we vlog a lot or any stuff like that because that's like who we are that's what we like to do right and like we could i could start putting out baseball content tomorrow but i don't fucking watch baseball so it doesn't make sense like people in my audience are obviously sports fans so they want to see more of that but like i'd be doing them a disservice if i started making content about things that i don't even like here here right i mean i'm right here with you <laughs> i'm right here with you baby I'm right here with you. And I'm also here with you expanding the presence beyond just yourself, right? You have one camera, one microphone, one host to start. That was BDGE was just you. And now you're starting to see more people on the channel, opening it up to others, giving them an opportunity. And that's what we've been doing. So I think we, that's one thing that you and I have been doing uh, together in this industry is bringing people along with us and expanding your channel, expanding your uh, media footprint to others where we have shows that I've never even been on. I've never even been on the future cast. I don't have never been on. It. I want to be on it, but when Cody wants me on, I'll be on. You don't think Cody wants you on? I'm here. Cody, asked. I'm here. If you want me on the future cast, I'll be on. This is a cry for help, Cody. He's insecure. This is his show. This is his show. Empowering others is necessary, but it requires confidence. You got to be confident that your audience will embrace new voices because they trust you, right? That's the key. And it takes time. It takes some time to build that trust, but once you have it, Knowing what to do with it is critical, and I think that's one of the keys to your success. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before, and it goes back to when you build something correctly, when you build something that you've kind of differentiated yourself from other people within the space, the the audience feels this uh, this loyalty or attachment to you, right? And they start to trust what you've been doing because you show up every single day. And after a consistent year, two years, three years, four years, it's like there's an undying trust there that if I like something and I put it in front of you, you're probably going to like it or you're going to trust me to do so. I'm not, you know, it, it's kind of all encompassing. It's the same thing with if you're doing like ad reads, if you're doing anything like that, where you're kind of pitching to your audience, you're, you're putting something new in front of them. You have to believe that you're adding value to their lives, right? Like if you're pitching something that you don't believe in, guess what happens? It's just like the boy who cried wolf. The next time you try to plug something that you do believe in, they're gonna have a little less trust in you. So it's like, if I have, you know, for instance, we have Noah Hills who, you know, does great work for you guys, does uh, started to do video work for, for me. He's someone who I followed for like years, right? And I've always really, really um, respected his work. And it's some, it's shit that I personally follow. And I'm like, I've become a better fantasy player and dynasty player literally because of the content that he's put out. And I want to give that value to my audience. He doesn't, he didn't really have a platform outside of Twitter. And me and him got on a call, I want to say like two years ago, and this was like right when COVID kicked off and I wanted to bring him on as a creator on the channel a while ago. And, you know, it just didn't work out for whatever reason COVID hit. And he was like doing some weird shit in Alaska at the time. And we couldn't really like make it work. So it's been a long time coming, but he's someone that I've always, you know, looked up to in terms of content creation. I was like, I want to bring him on. And I know that because the fact that I fuck with his stuff tells me that the people that like me and my stuff will internally like that as well. So it comes from this, like this belief in what you're doing or, or the things that you see that you personally like, like if you're, it's something that you're like, Oh shit, this is super valuable to me. Other people are also going to like it. Right. And they're already in your audience. So those are the people that are most likely to get on board with it. And that's why I see like, I don't know. I see a lot of brands like expanding and, 
and just adding on faces and names for no reason. But like, I almost feel like you need to tell a story with w the way you're building, right? There needs to be some sort of like family aspect to it. There needs to be some personal adherence to the way you're doing things. Otherwise, it's just weird. There's just like a lot of weirdness going on in the space, man. And I know you laughed because of basically what we were talking about right before we hit record and whether or not we we're going to put. And I wasn't even I wasn't even talking about those companies in particular, but just like the way people are scaling in this space, I feel like is is a little bit weird and a little bit skewed. But um, yeah, I don't even remember what the question was. I don't even know what I'm talking about Who anymore. Who cares? Yeah. What you said was great. And you know, we've built our entire organization from individuals that volunteered to just be part of the underworld at some point in time, right? They emailed me podfather at rotounderworld.com just said, Hey, is there anything I can do to help, you know, small, big task, you know, hit me. And I said, okay, well, we, we do actually need some things done in this area and this area, if you're interested and they say, sure. And then those that work hard and, and, have something to say their role continues to expand and expand and expand it's, the best example is our social media coordinator aaron stewart our last social media coordinator had to, to take a step away because you know he was uh currently in college and his schoolwork was was starting to be overwhelming and i i felt bad for him i was like yeah man i get it like that's the priority and then the very next day i got an email from aaron who was already doing a bunch of things for us and said, Hey man, I just want to let you know if I can take my role to the next level, I would love to in some way. I'm very, you know, I'm very flexible. There's a lot of things I can do. And I said, well, it's a funny thing. It's a, <laughs> that's it. Wow. Right. Talk about serendipity. I was like, I just got off the phone with someone and I do have a role that's begging for someone like you if you're interested in social media. He's like, hell yeah. And I was like, hell yeah. And that was pretty much how the company has become what it's become. It's just me saying hell yeah and someone else saying hell yeah and we <laughs> go do what we're going to do. That's it. Hundred, yeah, 100%. That's it. I feel it's like uh, – and, 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 and you'll realize too – like we've we've both built this up over a long period of time and faces have come and gone, man. Like you bring people onto the team and before you know it, they're off the team for whatever reason. Not like, you know, I, I'd be over here firing people just for the fuck of it. But more, normally they just, you know, come and go because their work ethic is not there. And that's the one constant I've always found. It's like if someone is putting in the work they will stay around. Like if you show up every single day, you're probably not the most talented dude, but you're going to be able to learn most of the shit that, uh, that we need done. Right. It's most of the stuff is not a very like creative process. We're not asking people to get on camera for 45 minutes and talk their face off or design shit for us. You know, it's very, very admin ish level work. So it's like the, the one constant I've always found of people that end up staying are just, if you can work your ass off and like put a little bit of innovation into what you're doing, you'll stay forever, man. And, and, and it goes back to like the building up the trust of the audience in the same way that we build up the trust of the audience by literally just showing up every day and putting in the work and then valuing what we're doing. That switches over from our mindset to the people that, that we work with, you know? Yeah. You're self-selecting a team that's going to mesh and going to align with your culture from the jump from the very beginning there, there's no there's no question there's a at no point I've ever said well, what's our culture here how do i how do i emphasize mm -hmm. culture right we gotta we gotta improve the culture we gotta do this with the culture no the culture is just the culture like it's just it's all you know this uh, interwoven into the fabric of what we're doing uh and i i do have to tell you and the audience that I do say no to product sponsorships. I've had people approach me and I said, you know what? I, you know, it's probably not a good idea. I don't think it's a fit or sometimes I prefer another product. Right. And I'm just like, you know what? I can't with a straight face promote this product. Cause I use this other product. And to be honest, like, it's just not, not that I would say that, you know, I'll just say, you know, some, you know, nebulous, you know, safe, response right just to be polite 
But uh, in the back of my head, I'm going, yeah. 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 So because th- 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 that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. It's not just about picking up every nickel along the way. Uh, the trust is a big part of it. The user experience is a big part of it. You know, I don't can't tell you how many times, you know, consultants or experts have, have, have said, hey, hey, you should do this with your site. You should do that with your site. Right. And I'm like, well, how would that work exactly? How would that look? How what would the user experience be like? And like, well, you know, they would scroll past and then they would. Do, and I was like, wait, wait, no, we're not doing that, man. We're not. No, it's not. I don't care if we'd make money on it. I don't care. It, it would look terrible. <laughs> OK. Or it would be annoying. So if it looks terrible or annoying, we don't do it. And I'm sure you're the same way. Uh, but, you know, we're not perfect. Like we talked earlier about mistakes we've made. Just share with the audience at least one big fuck up you've had where I have one. I'll, I'll give one after you go. Uh, but just a fuck up, a mistake you've made where you look back, and you're like, man, I wish we'd done this a little bit earlier, a little bit differently. Uh, Yeah, dude, I feel like. I feel like I don't really make uh, this is such a lie. Like I definitely make so many rash decisions, but I, I I guess, you know, it would always go back. I feel like any content creators biggest regret is not starting earlier. Um, And I feel like in particular on TikTok, I'm really like upset that we didn't hop on it. Like last summer, we did a little bit of work on there and probably the year before that, even fewer amounts of videos and was literally the same cycle for YouTube. Like when I started YouTube, I didn't take it that seriously. And then the next summer I took it a little bit more seriously. And the summer after that, I took it way more seriously. And then obviously with the more investment you put into it, the more return you see, but it's always like, damn, if I had done it a little bit more, a little bit better, worked a little bit harder here or there, like the returns are exponential at the beginning of it, right? Like the earlier you get in, the more that fucking bell curve is going to go straight up. So it's like the longer you wait, the bigger, uh, bigger disadvantage you have in the space. So I guess like off the top of my head, I would say, um, TikTok, and I, I don't really like, I don't know. I, I try not to say I regret a lot of like black and white decisions that I make because I, make those decisions based off like the knowledge at hand and what I would regret the least when I'm older. Right. Like that's, that's how I kind of like live my life. I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, this is a big decision for me when I'm 40, 50 or 60. When I look back, will I, will I regret having not gone down this path? Will I regret having not done this thing? And if the answer is, yeah, I'll regret it. I just do it. Right. Whether it's a short term L or uh, it's a financial loss or whatever in the, in in the short term, it's just like, fuck, like, you know, I wish uh, we had taken this more seriously, but I, uh, I don't know, man. I, I I don't have a lot off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll I'll kind of think about it as the episode. That was a good one. You were, you felt like you were slow to adopt TikTok in a serious way. And I have a similar regret in that we should have embraced YouTube in a similar way. I had the camera. I could have been flicking the camera on and doing my videos as I was uh, producing podcasts. So there's a lot of lost video content, and we would have been relatively early on YouTube had I just flicked the camera on and hit the upload button. We did put videos on YouTube, but they were these sort of slideshows that had less engagement. And so if, if I would go back in time, I would have started streaming earlier. I would have started putting more produced pieces on YouTube years earlier. Uh, so that that's that's my that's my big regret on the media side for sure. Fucked up. I feel like mo- Fucked up. Yeah. Most people in the space, I think, would probably say the same is that they didn't take YouTube seriously enough early enough and also learn the nuance. We, it, YouTube, I'm still learning the nuances with it, but I'm starting to to kind of hone in on the entire process of like making the piece of content, making it a, you know, the perfect length, making it quality when people actually click on it and getting people to click on it. Like the combination of the thumbnail to the title is a very, very difficult, uh, art to, to master. And I'm nowhere near close to that, but I feel like I've kind of, uh, turned a corner on that particular subject over like the last year or so. You're doing Um, great. Yeah, and we're starting to see it come to fruition a little bit, and that's it's such a, an important part of YouTube. But again, I'd go back to just like looking at other content creators in 
in other spaces and seeing why their shit works and seeing how you can bring it back to to our industry and what we're doing. And that that itself will play itself out over the long run. There are a lot of tactics and stuff that that can work right now in what we're doing, but you don't want to be a tactic fueled brand or creator. No, yeah, you want to take a step back, get a strategy, and then the, the tactics will come. But you have mm-hmm. to pay attention to the details with tactics. You have to actively go out and watch other people's TikToks, watch other people's videos. I watch this YouTube channel. I subscribe to Rick Beato. Do you know who Rick Beato is? I don't. He's a musician, and he has a channel called Everything Music. And he has like the top 10 guitar solos. He talks about how to get the right sound with your bass. Right, he he breaks down uh, lawsuits that happen and whether he thinks that you know someone's going to win in their lawsuit against Katy Perry for stealing their song, all that kind of stuff. And he has this one video where they reimagine the Stairway to Heaven guitar solo. What if Eddie Van Halen did it? Right. So here's the Eddie Van Halen sound in the context of the Stairway to Heaven. Guitar solo, which is like a minute plus long guitar solo. It's like you can't even it, it's become a meme after Wayne's World and um, uh, Saturday Night Live. But it's true that that guitar solo is the Holy Grail, not just because it's so good and so melodic, but it's so long <laughs> and you just have to have strong fingers to do it and endurance like stamina and uh so he, he does this video, and it's a great video, but he talked about it on another show, and it's why sometimes this behind-the-scenes, inside-baseball content is so engaging. It's why I wanted to talk a little bit about this with you today, is that he talked about that video, and he's like, and I couldn't believe it when he said it. He said that that thumbnail is on its eighth iteration, and he said, I'm still not happy with it. He said, it's still in the back of my mind that we're not getting that thumbnail right. And it's been eight tries that he keeps going back and doing that thumbnail. It's like the U2 one video. They shot that video three times. I remember because it was it was on TRL back when they, there was this, this total request live was to show on MTV back in the day. And U2 kept putting out a different version of the one video on Octung Baby. And they couldn't get that right. And Beato says that this is his white whale thumbnail. And it's like, oh, my God, I was listening to that. And I was like, oh, my God, I should share this with Nick. I got to share this. He he could totally relate to this. I'm sure he could. Dude, it's it's I love that because that's like it's such a real uh, it's such a real part of like the creative process is you just have this inner feeling about whether it is or isn't like you do something and it's just like. Man, was that it's not even whether it was good or bad or right or wrong. It's just like that was it or it wasn't it. And I think when you put like your like really your touch onto it, when you're like, okay, I don't care what the industry is doing. I don't care how this is going to look to the outside world. This is like what's really inside of me right now. And I need to get it out when you could hit that nail on the head. It's such a it's such a cool feeling, even if even if it means like you know, half the people that normally would watch your shit don't, I still feel like it's a, uh, like a, a depth verse with conversation. And a lot of people get so caught up on these numbers, but when you do those little things right, and you actually use yourself to create what you're like, uh, that's, that's a weird way to put it, but like you really put in who you are to what you're creating. That's when you really build like the most loyal people man because that's how people relate they they relate to the weirdness inside of you when you're able to actually execute that and be like yes this is what i was like trying to put on paper this is what i was trying to exemplify to the world man it's like a it's a very very cool feeling especially when just a few people can relate to it it's a it's very uh i guess like humbling and fun and it's it's really like what you know drives me and probably you and the other creators out there to continue doing what they're doing just to to connect and relate to those people that do fuck with the things that are really true to you if you're on YouTube and you're not thinking about thumbnails in a deep way, you're fucking up. Okay, that's a fuck up, right? That's in and of itself a fuck up. And uh, the maestro of our thumbnails is Matt Dunleavy. And we're just at a different point in our evolution than you are. 
we're just now getting to a place where we can produce thumbnails that are good and consistent. That's the first step in, in getting to a place you can be happy with, where I feel like you're getting to this other place where now you're going to this creative place where you're trying to make sure your thumbnails don't look like other people's thumbnails. And even if it may, in the short run, lead to a few less clicks, a few fewer views, who cares? Like, you want to be out there on the bleeding edge where people look back in a couple of years and go, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those thumbnails were actually totally hip and cool and were way ahead of their time. And I think that's probably the place where you're headed. Yeah. It, I mean, it's very obvious. It's very easy to see, like, when everybody is doing something, you need to pivot to something else. And if you're going to be the first one to do it, obviously, you need to know that it's going to take a little hit in the forefront, but it's going to be the best thing for you in the long term. And, you know, you're playing the long term game. I'm playing. The, I'm in this shit for life, man. I want to do what's best for us long term. Yeah. And it also satisfies my career. I'm, I haven't had this much fun making thumbnails in fucking years. We outsourced them to a guy like three months ago, this kid, Kyle, who's doing a lot of thumbnails for us. But as we as we got him in and like his work started to inspire me. I find myself messaging him like every day being like, Hey, I'm going to do the thumbnail for my personal video. And I'm like head down into the computer for like an hour a day, making my thumbnails. I'm like, this is fun as shit. It's super satisfying for me. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, that, 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 I love us drilling in We're like, Hey, it's not just enough to talk about our YouTube channels. Let's drill into this one specific yeah. component of it because the people need to know the people need to know. But they also tune in for football, so we have to also satiate the football appetite. That's why we're here. That's what our channels focus on. And March was a fun month. I made a bunch of videos just on NFL free agent moves. It was great for us, right? We didn't have to wake up and, and think about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> it was like it was right in front of us on the news feed. That was great. So – what were some of those NFL moves from March that you were most inspired by to go out and, and create videos or talk about? Um, I think from just a, a football perspective, like Allen Robinson to L.A. was such a fucking savvy move by them. Like the fact mm. that their entire – offense revolved around these like versatile explosive playmakers and then two of them go down to me they're almost like doing the Alabama where it's like Mechie and uh Jameson Williams can tear their ACLs it's like we don't give a fuck we got 17 John Mechie's lined up and LA just took that college game and made it professional and you no team does that man that that is a really really hard maneuver to pull what they just did having Odell go down having Robert Woods go down not know like listen, those guys can be back in a full strength next season, but they're like, we're still in this prime window of championship moves. We are taking no chances with that. Cause guess what? If both those guys are not ready, Odell's is late. He probably won't be back until midway, maybe three quarters of the way into the season. Robert Woods, who knows? He has a complication. He can't play. Like that team's not winning the championship if their only weapon uh, actually they might with Cooper Cup's that fucking good. But you get the point. Like if Cooper Cup's their only weapon out there, they have a significant hit to the chances of winning. They said, fuck it, we're not gonna take the chances. We will out with the old, in with the new, recoup at Allen Robinson. So I thought that move was savvy as shit from the front office, just you know, not even thinking about it, not playing around moving A Rob in there. Uh, just to, I mean, just to basically a two year, fifteen million dollar deal to get Allen like, Robinson. I mean, just so good. Right. He so was good. one of the best, if not the best wide receiver available in free agency because, you know, Devontae Adams, Devontae Adams wasn't really involved. I mean, he was never going to hit the open market. Right. But in terms of a, a wide receiver that was going to hit the open market, Allen Robinson was one of the best to ever hit the open market four years ago. And now he is again. And the Rams are looking around going, wait, they're. There's no rush to sign this guy. There's a rush to sign Christian Kirk and DJ Shark, but not this guy. He's just out here in the wind. Yeah, well, I guess we'll pick up the phone, and he's certainly an upgrade over Robert Woods. I mean, I like Robert Woods, but when you have Cooper Cup, you don't really need Robert Woods. Robert Woods plays the Cooper Cup role in a lot of teams, so he should go somewhere else where he can play the Cooper Cup role. 
And then you can get what you have been missing all this time, which is a proper outside X receiver that can win in contested situations, that can be the go-to guy in the red zone. Odell can get up there, but he's still 5'11". Right? He's not necessarily a proper X receiver. I'd rather have him play Z with Cooper Cup at Y, and then there's this this gaping void at X. You don't really want... Van Jefferson out there either. He's more of a Z receiver. So it's just such a great skill match with exactly what they needed to optimize the, the configuration of talent in that passing game. Yeah, dude. I uh, On the flip side of that, I do love Robert Woods landing in Tennessee. I thought it was a perfect match for what they have or what they don't have over there in Tennessee. Like, not good for fantasy. Obviously, you know, we, we don't know what's going on at the ACL, and he's going to be probably like a wide receiver three and kind of a boring one in a super run-heavy offense. But, like, Fit wise, I mean that's perfect because AJ Brown's just going to be running a muck downfield, and Robert Woods just kind of playing the underneath routes for for Ryan Tannehill. I think adds a really big boost um, for them. And like Allen Robinson, like the perfect addition for for Matt Stafford because it's it's exactly what you said is he plays a different type of receiver. All these other guys are just kind of throwing out on the field and being and are like be versatile, run this route and this route and this route and this route and do this with the ball in your hands. Stafford's always liked having a dude that can just get up and, and, and get the fucking ball when he chucks a 45. Like, uh, whether it's Calvin Mar- Johnson, uh, Kenny yeah, Galladay, they, they've been missing kind of Kenny that Galladay. in Los yeah, Angeles. They need, they need a guy that can get up and do it. So that was like the perfect fit. I'm sure Stafford was parading around the front office making sure that shit happened. Um, so perfect, perfect fit. And then I got to say, like, obviously, but like Russ to Denver, man. Yeah. At, that is so fucking exciting because it's probably one of the first times that he gets to play behind an offensive line that's at least like above average, right? So he'll have a little bit of time back there. And then you look at the weapons, man. Why can't Cortland Sutton be DK Metcalf? Why can't Jerry Judy be Tyler Lockett? Javante Williams, if Thank Melvin you. Gordon's not there, holy fucking. Yo, this Denver offense yeah. is is going to be exciting. So Jacob Rickroad is uh, at Clutch Fantasy on Twitter, and he's in a uh, – Dynasty startup with several other analysts. And he screenshotted the first and second round and uh, just basically talked about, you know, why you know, his pick in the second round would have been Russell Wilson. Super flex startup. Russell Wilson's got to be at least a second round pick, if not an early second round pick. But you look at the board and it went Malik Willis, Trey Lance, Trevor Lawrence, And no Russell Wilson. And that was shocking to me. I was like, what? Really? Because Russell Wilson's 34. He probably has at least a couple more years where he's relatively mobile, where he's going to put up, you know, a few hundred rushing yards at least, some rushing touchdowns. That's going to bolster his fantasy production. And he's already one of the most efficient passers in the league. And you start giving him some volume, no matter where he goes, as long as he gets out from under Pete Carroll and that backwards offense, those backwards offense in the NFL last and plays run last year. Whichever team finishes last and plays run should immediately fire their entire coaching staff. That should be a <laughs> rule they, they shouldn't al- be allowed to coach in the NFL after finishing last and plays run. It's like the ultimate uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, relegation. Yeah. Relegation minor standard. Would be, hey, do you finish last in plays run? And then it'd be a race, right? The the to finish above the relegation line where okay, or the bottom three. Like we just can't be in the bottom three of plays run. Everyone in the bottom three gets fired. That should be the rule. And so to have Russell Wilson now at age 34, where he have his age 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. I mean, we're already at five years in Dynasty. That's as far out as you want to project anyway whereas if you if you're drafting trevor lawrence there or trey lance there or especially malik willis there it's a complete projection it's just hoping that these guys eventually become russell wilson so that's one of the great mistakes i see in dynasty all the time is drafting a player in hopes of he'll become a player who's still in the player pool I can't believe Malik Willis went above Russell Wilson. That is fucking weird. Uh, I I guess you could I mean, make maybe the... it was a mistake. Maybe because he's a W, he was down at the bottom and no one saw him or they forgot about him. I I, I don't know, but 
sometimes a player will have a, a down season and they'll be in their mid thirties and just the fickle fantasy crowd will just stop drafting them where they need to be drafted in dynasty. And it's like, Hey, wait, wait, no, 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 no. He's got at least three good years, le- at least three good years left. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's such a cornerstone piece of a championship roster right now, especially if you're getting him at it. I remember drafting him in like the third round of a super flex startup like three years ago. And I was like a little, I was like, ah, you know, Russ is one of like the older kind of quarterbacks there. And now we're looking at him. His value fucking went up three years later in a draft like that. Like, uh, I get the appeal of wanting to, I mean, Trey Lance was getting picked at like the two Oh fucking seven last year in startups and whatever. Trevor Lawrence. I think you could make the argument above Russ, but like, there's no shot. I'm taking Malik Willis. If you want to get spicy, I could, I could understand Trey Lance, but I, like, why, why, like, why are you trying to get too cute with that? He's now in Denver. Like he's been rescued. He has yeah. Sutton and he has Judy and he has an offensive line. And it's just, like, it's, 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 it's a whole new world. We don't know what he's going to be. Top five offense is very much in their range of outcomes in Denver. And top five quarterback is very much in his range of outcomes, especially for fantasy football, where he's probably going to be top 10 in rushing production. Why not? Why not? It's just a weird thing, man. Sports fans, football fans, fantasy footballers have... A fickle nature to them with certain players, right? Certain players will always be overvalued. Certain players will always be undervalued. And Russell Wilson falls in that group of players that have just been perpetually undervalued. It's like it's it's this uh, this weird thing where if you hit a certain age and you have any stretch of poor play, the public immediately basically gets off of you. You know what I mean? Like if you're at, if you're at the end of a, of a year and you're like, okay, he's 30, whatever. He just had a bad season. I mean, the hill to climb back up to win the, the hearts of fantasy players is very, it's a very arduous hill to climb. And that's kind of where Russell Wilson is. I feel like we see that with a lot of, uh, a lot of veteran players. Like we're seeing it with Deandre Hopkins. I was just going to skip ahead because it was one of your questions about like ADPs right now. Like Deandre Hopkins in super flex leagues, redraft super flex, underdog is going in like the fifth fucking round i got him at like the 504 the other day what and i get yeah and i get it like he is a little bit older it's coming off of uh, an injury riddled season but that shit makes no sense to me like that is the discount on these veteran players where if anything the situation is far more positive for him right christian kirk is gone aj green's gonna be gone that entire offense just got really really consolidated behind you know chase edmonds is gone so it's like legitimately just DeAndre Hopkins, Rondell Moore, Zach Ertz through the air, right? Like, right. N- it, it's so different, so many different pieces there, too, that they all play. Their, like, DeAndre Hopkins is going to get 150, 160 targets again this year and probably go nuts with him. So, I don't know, dude. The, the, the whole veteran um, the whole veteran back off from the entire industry is something that's really, really easily exploitable. We have best ball rankings on Player Profiler, including Superflex for underdogs specifically, and we have... DeAndre Hopkins ahead of Jalen Waddle, because of course we do, <laughs> because yeah. he's DeAndre Hopkins, and he has very little target competition with a better quarterback than Jalen Waddle. So Jalen Waddle is far less proven, has a lesser quarterback, and is competing for targets with uh, Tyreek Hill. <laughs> it's just yes, they're. They're they're close, right? They're they're close in the rankings, but Waddle's going at least seven picks earlier on underdog, and yet we have Hopkins ranked higher. So it just so happens that you know our subscribers are going to get a bunch of Hopkins, and they're not going to get much Waddle, and we believe that's an advantage for our subscribers. Yeah, the the Waddle situation is a very tricky one to uh, to figure out because. People don't want to admit it, but last year he was a volume play. When you look at like the efficiency on a per touch or per target basis, he was fine. He wasn't any fucking groundbreaking type of player last year, but they were funneling targets to him at the line of scrimmages over and over. And that's the kind of player Tua is. So like, you know, that's probably we can expect again. But I mean, you add a dude who's like a top three wide receiver in the entire fucking league and Tyreek Hill, and you think that's a positive for Jalen Waddle, that shit is absurd to me. So Waddle's well, AEP they did pay to... him also like that as well. 
Like it wasn't it wasn't just that they lucked into it, right? Or they they somehow got an Allen Robinson at value type of thing. No, 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 no. They they went out and paid a lot to get him. Yeah, Waddle, in picks Waddle's, and money. It's scary. He was a volume player, and now the one part of the equation that we knew for sure was the volume. We're still not sure about his efficiency. Okay, you you turn that lever down, and it's like, what do we actually know in the equation now? So Waddle's like a young, explosive player that. You know, uh, I could be wrong on, but there is no fucking way I'm taking Waddle over DeAndre Hopkins in fantasy football this year. And I have no idea how this offense is going to be constructed. It's possible that Tyree Kill is actually used like Debo Samuel was used in San Francisco. That mm-hmm. they are bringing in Tyree Kill to be this mini version of Debo to give him a bunch of rushing attempts and jet sweeps. And that maybe bring down his target depth significantly and ratchet up the volume, make him a more consistent fantasy asset. He might be more consistent, less overall fantasy points scored, but more consistent in Miami. The issue with that is then Jalen Waddle becomes Brandon Ayuk. And we saw Brandon Ayuk in his second year take a step back in the production because he experienced a target boom in the second half when the other receivers around him were injured. Does that ring a bell at all? Does that, does that any, any similarities to any other situations, Nick, that you can remember that? No. Yeah, dude, the, uh, the, the Tyreek Hill conundrum is uh, this whole Miami offense is fucked, man. Like everybody took a basic out. I mean, I, I love to see that they're building around Tua. But I, I don't think they're actually building around Tua. I think they're just building around their quarterback position. They're just building with, to build. Right. And I think that's the right move as an offense. Like, you can get Terry Kill. You can get um, whoever the uh, big-time tackle they brought in was. If, now you have the wide receiver one and the left tackle of the future for whoever their quarterback is. I find it hard to believe that they believe Tua is the guy. Tua felt a lot like... Uh, Teddy Bridgewater with a left hand last year, right? And that's not the guy you want leading your franchise. He could be like Jimmy G, though, right? And the the narrative is, like, too strong at this point with Mike McDaniels coming over and then Tyreek Hill to Debo Samuel and just them playing a very similar style of game where it's short dump-offs. I'm into that, though. I'm into that. Yeah. Very rarely do I lead with the coach-centric analysis, but in this particular case, the similarities are so striking, and... The interviews with Mike McDaniel suggest that he has a particular plan in place, which essentially is to stick with what worked in San Francisco. And even though I think San Francisco punched above their weight last year in the playoffs, they still made a run in the playoffs. And he's still a coach that's coming off a very successful season and they brought him there to I think, emulate what they were doing with the 49ers. So if there was one case where you would say, okay, because this is such a black box offense, we now have no idea what it's going to look like. All we can do is, is map some tendencies over to Miami from San Francisco. I think that's a fair thing to do. It's very rarely good analysis. It's typically a red herring analysis to say, hey, because of Coach X, player Y is going to do Z. In this particular case, because we have so little information what this offense is going to look like, going to San Francisco for some clues seems rational. Yeah, I mean, we don't have we we have like nothing to work off of. You, there's no yeah. offensive player on that team where you could sit here and be like, I'm confident. This is going to be their role. I'm confident this is the fantasy outlook. I'm confident in X, Y, Z. And it's like a lot of times when you have, you know, you have good players, you like to just take the quarterback. But it's like I'm also not confident in Tua. Like I'll take him as my second quarterback in a super flex league. I'm not overpaying. I think what my overall consensus on this team is going to end up being is that I'm not targeting anybody per se. Mm -hmm. I won't overpay for him. I likely won't even take them if it's at their like exact price point or ADP. But if they fall to me a few spots lower, I'm okay having it. I'm interested in this backfield though, dude. I kind of feel like I've never been a Raheem Mostert guy. He's always he's always given away like the most amount of red flags 
coming into seasons, like oh, so yeah. obviously in a void. Oh yeah, he has like an exhaust like coming off the back of him, and it's just red flags. Yeah, it's it, it's so many of them. I feel like he might be handed the exact role that he had in San Fran, though. And if and it, now you're getting to draft him like six rounds later than you typically would have because no one cares about him. Everyone's forgot about him. Right. He had the bad year. He's a little bit older. But again, his coach just signed him to a deal. So I I'm a little bit worried that Chase Edmonds is going to be relegated to a similar role to what he had in Arizona. And we're going to see Mostert handed the early down work because he was really fucking good when he had it in San Francisco. Obviously couldn't stay healthy. We're going to see some sort of tandem. And this feels like a tandem where you probably want to take the least expensive guy. It's just the Chase Edmonds isn't that expensive. That's the thing. I typically yeah. would look at an uncertain situation and just take the least expensive guy. But in analyzing Raheem Mostert, he went undrafted. He's now 30. Litany of lower body injuries. Typically, these players do not have great seasons. <laughs> Typically, they flash. Or, more often, they get hurt in training camp and we never hear from them. And he signed you know, a close to a bare minimum yearly contract because I think the league feels this way about him, whereas at least Chase Edmonds, I mean, Chase Edmonds didn't sign for James Conner money, but he's at least making a lot more than Mostert. And if you look at Mostert's salary versus Gaskins versus Edmonds, Edmonds should be the clear lead back. And if we are looking back to San Francisco for clues, this has been an offense where they like to pick a winner and say, hey, this is our starter for now. This is our primary back for now until he gets hurt. So we might see Mostert at some point in the season because they got Chase Edmonds hurt. Right? That's also possible. So th there are iterations for this backfield that I can see uh, where – if you drafted Mostert and you drafted Edmonds, that they both find their way uh, into your lineup at some point. But that's not how we play. In best ball, we, we pick a winner, right? We decide, hey, we're, we're not going to hedge our bets. You're betting against yourself when you do that. You might as well either just say, hey, I'm a Mostert guy, I'm an Edmonds guy, or I'm even a Gaskins guy. Because this offense, the stretch zone, chews up running backs and spits them out, we could easily see Miles Gaskin have a six-week run where he's an RB1 in fantasy over that time. Like, if you're drafting in those late rounds, this is one of those teams where you will want to go ahead and, and, and draft the third running back based on the history of this particular running philosophy where yeah, they, 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 they just ask the running back to put their foot in the ground and just go upfield as fast as you can and just trust that a hole will open in front of you, and that puts them in a vulnerable situation. Yeah, the scary part about trusting like a committee here is that anytime we've had this conversation of which running back do we take in this committee because we know one of them are going to do really well, the reason for that is – because it's been on the Patriots or it's been on the Niners. And those are teams with really good offensive lines, very good offenses, and they produce at the running back position. For Miami, we don't know that that's the case. This offense, yes, they've added pieces, and it's more likely that they're good or a lot better than they were last year. But this could also just be a below average offense. And it's like, am I really trying to take the third committee back in an offense that's scoring? 20 points per game with a run blocking line that ranks 23rd in the league or something where typically these other offenses that we're yelling about when it comes to the committees where you want to pick someone, you want to pick the cheapest one. We know the Niners are going to combine to be top five in fantasy points at the running back position. We know the Patriots are going to give the running backs a shit ton of touches. So you want piece of that. We still don't really know if we want pieces of the Miami backfield, right? We do have the one coach coming over. I do. I want pieces line. of this backfield. I don't want the passing game, right? I think they're going to dial back the pass attempts and focus on the running game. This is what they do, right? This is the philosophy, is that San Francisco's never been a high-volume offense. 
right? Especially high volume pass attack. And I think that one of the ways that you can protect Tua and limit mistakes and, and, and uh, you know, uh, minimize his flaws is by leaning on the running game. That's why you bring in all these pieces. We bring in Edmonds and Mostert, right? So that we'll always have some capable all-purpose back out there, whether it's Mostert, whether it's Gaskins, whether it's Edmonds. They can all do it all, right? And then now they're adding Teron Armstead, like you said. So the offense in general has taken this huge step forward, and fantasy gamers are building in you know, an expect, like a, a big expected leap for this offense, when you look at the it, Waddle ADP, the Hill ADP, but they're not boosting the running backs. So that's where I think the value is in fantasy football is with the backfield, not the passing game in Miami. Yeah, well, dude, Chase is going on underdog right now, pick 123. Dude, it's a really interesting cohort of usually once you get past pick 100, you're strictly choosing between backups it gets to like the tony pollard alexander madison and you're reaching for those guys this year it's an interesting um makeup like you do have the pollard but you have rashad penny you have kareem hunt going at 110 quarter patterson clyde Edwards Hilaire, miles sanders chase edmonds ramondre stevenson like those are a lot of really good running backs with a lot of upside obviously like they're risky and could end up being straight duds coming out of those uh coming out of that area but there are a lot of interesting backs there um so like Chase Edmonds and Miles Sanders going outside of pick 115 starts to make you think of, you know, early strategy and hitting wide receivers early here because I don't know, dude, I, I'd be OK padding. I didn't realize Chase was going that low down at 123 is is definitely a spot that I can get on board. Most starts going at one like 180, 145 right now. OK, Um for that price, like, I mean, you know, you want to use your 11th and 13th round pick on guys like that. Like, yeah. I'm all in the, on the that. The difference isn't big enough. The, the disparity is not wide enough for me to go most dirt over the guy that's getting so much more money, is younger, fresher, and better in the passing game. And the running back benefits when the offense improves, and the offense is improved. Armstead is, is the biggest improvement. See, Armstead mm. is more important than Tyreek Hill. In that what happens when you add an arm set is everyone on that offensive line gets to move down. So the left tackle moves to right tackle. His job just got easier. The right tackle moves to guard. His job just got easier. So you make everybody's job easier when you add a cornerstone left tackle like that. And you give to him more time. And then maybe he can connect down the field with Tyreek Hill more frequently because he has more time. And now all of a sudden there's wider running lanes. And so this offense is going to be better. It is going to be better. I just question the pass to run ratio. I hope that they crank up the pass attempts, but they did not do that in San Francisco. And, and this is again, all we have to go on. This is a huge mystery. And in week one, it's going to be one of the games I'm most focused on is the Miami game, because I want to see what this offense looks like. I want to look at their tendencies and I want to see how they're breaking down. Are they playing fast? Are they throwing often? And that will significantly affect our assumptions for this offense for weeks you know, two through 18. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in Miami, but we I do know. know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun to watch. It'll be fun uh, to that, see how it plays out. There's going to be – I feel like we're just going to see at the running back position, like we said, multiple weeks with multiple running backs where there's going to be pockets of most There's going to be pockets of Edmonds. I doubt any of them end up, you know – reigning supreme over the course of the season because I think at this point in their career we kind of have seen that they're probably not those guys um but you know staying light on your feet when it comes to this backfield is going to be super super key and you know this r does not get discussed enough but understanding the uh, known unknowns of an offense is important which is another reason why we're not advocating for drafting Jalen Waddle because this is a piece of an offense who is expensive, right? With maximum uncertainty. So you don't need to be a hero and draft a Tyreek Hill or a Jalen Waddle. You don't. We know there's a huge uncertainty overhang with this offense. So I would rather just take another wide receiver with a similar ADP 
on an offense with a lot more stability and certainty heading into this year where the pieces remain the same, the coaching staff remains the same. That predictability and certainty has real value in those early rounds. So just forget drafting Dolphins early, right? And decide, okay, I can get maximum asymmetrical upside by drafting Dolphins late, right? Because of all this team uncertainty, there's a bigger payoff if you draft the the players that are available later in the ADP, later in your draft. And then draft players earlier on offenses and in situations that are more stable. Sounds like you're playing it safe, Matt. I don't like that. Is is it too safe? Coward. Is it is it too safe to to um, draft players in situations that are stable, who are trustworthy in those early rounds, like DeAndre Hopkins, and then take huge swings in the second half of your draft? Is that suddenly, uh, you know? Too safe? Too conservative? Am I leaving no. money on the table? Am I playing scared? Is that what's I, going I on here? Or is that just rational? Is that just smart? I don't think we... Uh, just literally looking at the running back position ADPs now and like starting to scan over the other positions, like maybe we say this every year, but I don't, I don't typically see as much upside... Um, normally in drafts as I feel like there is this year at ADP 100 or later. Like it feels like this might be a year honestly going on the strategy that you had where safety up front is going to be rewarded because the upside on the back end, the risk reward upside on the back end feels like it's pretty volume heavy. And there's a lot of dudes you could swing and, you know, hit or miss on. And I feel like that's kind of always the way to build like a successful season long roster is to take the, I mean, at the end of the day, like you're, first three picks, right? If things go right, are going to end up making or scoring like 50 to 60% and maybe not that high, but like 40, 40% of your weekly fantasy points on a team. So if you miss on one of those picks, you're falling behind a significant percentage amongst the other league mates. And you need to make that up by hitting on high upside picks later on. But those are also the riskiest picks. So you have the less, the least likelihood of actually hitting on those picks. So it's super important to have picks one, two, three, four, five, be a little more safe because, again, they make up the large quantity of the actual fantasy points that your team is scoring on a weekly basis. And if you can get those narrowed down right and hammered right, the upside at the back end makes your team a league-winning team. And another player who is now going before Waddle, but there was a period of time when he was going after Waddle, is T. Higgins. And the Bengals are the ultimate stable team. Quarterback, the same. Coaches, the same. Personnel, the same. Well, the personnel is almost the same. It's not quite the same because they did upgrade the one weakness. So they had a weakness in their interior pass protection. And they they went out and signed only guards in free agency. <laughs> so <laughs> they did the perfect thing to maximize stability. And if you also want upside with stability... I give you T. Higgins. T. Higgins has incredible upside, right? What he would be in the event of an injury to Boyd or Chase is completely unknown. That that's the untapped upside of a T. Higgins. But on a week to week basis, he could win you a matchup in a seasonal league context. You're always starting him just in case. And in best ball. He's going to have a ton of boom performances, and that's what you're looking for in DFS and best ball. You're looking for those spike weeks. That's the similarity between best ball and DFS is that best ball and DFS are a little more focused on the spike weeks as opposed to traditional seasonal leagues. And regardless of the context, you're going to want T. Higgins. Okay, that That's a guy to draft. Even if the total fantasy points or the fantasy points per game shakes out about the same as some other wide receivers that don't give you the spike weeks. I want the spike weeks. Dude, you want stability plus upside draft as many Bengals players as you possibly can yeah. because those offensive line upgrades, you had Kappa, you had fucking Lyle Collins, you had Ted Harris. Like that was their one weakness on offense. And they still were giving you like weak winning upside on, a, on literally every single week. It was like Burrow, Chase. If you had them in your lineups, you basically won the championship. Mixon this year, man, like he was already the RB5. 
And I wasn't really preparing to draft him again this year because I feel like they had this plan in mind where they just don't want to hand over the pass catching work. But now it's like if we just saw what he could do just running the ball fantasy wise behind a shit offensive line. This is this is like I mean, it, it, it's like the Chargers with more stability. Like we know the Chargers yeah. have this crazy weekly upside and the Bengals basically did exactly what the Chargers did last year. But now they're a better team. And now they're coming into their second year with Chase and Burrow together. And now Burrow's not coming into the year off an ACL tear. He's two years removed from it, not one year removed from it. And right. now Mixon solidify workhorse. And now we got the – it's like – bro, it's Joe all coming Mixon together. Joe Mixon is the Russell Wilson of running backs in that people are drafting Javante Williams in hopes of getting Joe Mixon. Right, And this is happening in best ball. This is happening everywhere where, of course, in Dynasty, Javante Williams is a first-round pick. But – Best ball, seasonal leagues. You're seeing Javante Williams be drafted before Joe Mixon based on the projection and the speculation that maybe he's Joe Mixon. <laughs> it's just what? I, I love Javante, dude. I, th I think <laughs> What I think are we I talking might've... about? Get Joe Mixon. How is he a second-round pick? I don't understand that. So... Um, I've been only doing super flex drafts on underdog recently. I've been doing their, their, uh, super flex tournament. And I mean, the ADPs just go nuts when you start to get into super flex leagues, especially on like tournament games. Cause no one actually goes by like a scheduled ADP. You're kind of like everyone's uh, running a muck and doing their own strategy or whatever. And I continue to see Javante drop to like the mid third round. Oh yeah. And it's like, I like to try to bake into, you know, obviously his situation is going to change rapidly depending on what happens with the Melvin Gordon. And we've got some, we've got some sources that say he's probably a 10 to 15% chance of returning to the Broncos. So I would say we're much more on the heavier side of Javante leading that backfield. And it goes back to like, all right, we saw a couple good games of him. We haven't seen. Hold him on, hold on. Wilson. What are the chances of Melvin Gordon signing with the Bengals? Not very high. Zero. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so again, just draft Joe Mixon, motherfuckers. I don't know, dude. Uh, if Melvin's gone, I might debate you, Javante Mixon. But it's it, it's just like there there is there <laughs> is a. Why are we taking Javon a chance at this point? Javante's got a higher pass catching upside, in my opinion, than Mixon does. I, we're five years into Mixon's career, and he's just not the pass catcher that we wanted him to be. We're speculate. We'll continue to speculate on it, and there's just no need to dump him off the ball when you have. Higgins and Chase and Boyd running a muck over the middle. And I think in Denver, ah, maybe you don't either, but Russ being there, imagine how big the fucking holes are going to be. Russ has never dumped it off to the running back. That's never been a thing he does. He typically will pull it down and, and run like three yards and out of bounds. That's what he likes to do. It's just, That's a it, it, it doesn't make sense, man. It, it Like I said, you can get the upside of the primary back in the hu Bengals offense without taking chances, right? You can play it safe and get the upside. That's the beauty of Bengals. <laughs> right? do, you, do you think Javante is a risky pick if Melvin Gordon doesn't resign? If Melvin Gordon signs back with Denver, then Javante loses two rounds of ADP. Sure, but if he doesn't. Right. If he doesn't, then I think it's a conversation. If he doesn't, then I would still go Joe Mixon because I think Joe Mixon has a, a, a much longer track record. I know what Joe Mixon is, and I know what this offense is. I hope that the Broncos are a great offense. I want to see it. It would be nice to see it, right? It is a projection. So when you think about this spectrum, of offenses we know versus what we don't know. I mean, Denver's more on the don't know end of the spectrum. Whereas again, the Bengals are the most locked in offense that we can set our watches by. And that to me has value in those early rounds where those, those selections are so valuable. I see cavalier behavior by fantasy gamers every year taking chances they don't need to take just because there's a player available three spots later who's going to give you a similar upside with way lower risk. That's all. It's The problem is Javante Williams is way more fun than Joe Mixon. And a lot of us are in this for fun. 
and pushing the button on Javante is fun. It's fun. Like the unknown upside is fun. I just know I also have, you know, round five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifty, six, where I can do more upside drafting. That's all. That's all. That's it. It's a very. It's a fair point, Matt. You've you've made me rethink things. I've brought it up with the committee, and we have decided we are still taking Javante no! fucking Williams. Baby. God damn it. God damn it. All right. So you mentioned earlier Clyde Edwards Hilaire. And so one of my positions I've taken on TikTok and everywhere is that uh, there is a distinct possibility that the Kansas City Chiefs finish fourth in this division. It's just that no one wants to really think about that possibility because the idea that Patrick Mahomes won't be in the playoffs, it's just who wants to go there? You don't want to think bad thoughts. We want to think happy thoughts. So why even think about how the Chiefs are shedding talent and now Patrick Mahomes just lost his go-to receiver and they replaced him with Marquez Valdez-Scantling and now they're going to try to bring in a rookie and the division is the most difficult division in the NFL now that Russell Wilson is a Bronco and that the Chargers are leveraging this Justin Herbert rookie contract to the best of their ability, just building strength on strength. And, like, the Raiders were a playoff team last year, and they just got Devontae Adams. So I'm thinking through how this division's going to play out, and number one, whoever wins that division I think should be a favorite to win the Super Bowl just as the Rams won the Super Bowl coming out of the hardest division last year. And then you got to start thinking about the possibility that the Chiefs finish last, Andy Reid's gone, and that they have to sort of retool around this albatross of a contract that they gave to Patrick Mahomes. There ain't no fucking way Andy Reid is out after <laughs> after this season, Matt. You had me up until, like, maybe Kansas City finishes fourth, which I don't believe is really a possibility. Um, Andy Reid being out, that feels like – that feels a little – a bit, a little bit dramatic. It's like the, uh, the Bill Belichick being out after last year or whatever. Um, there ain't no way they're getting rid of Andy Reid. I think he just got the extension to, I mean, when you have Patrick Mahomes, they clearly know how valuable it is given the oh, contract. Oh no, did he just get an extension? Probably. I don't know if it happened this year, but I, I feel like did coaches he just are getting, just, did I just say that after he just got an extension? Oh, that would be just rich. That would be rich. He's extended through 2025. Oh, no. I feel like coaches get extensions yearly. Like, every year, coaches get five-year extensions. I don't really know how their contracts work, but it happens far too often. And I don't know. There there hasn't been much I haven't liked at Andy Reid. He's an offensive coach, man, and he's doing pretty fucking magical things over there. Obviously, oh, he the was Chiefs extended play. in 2020, dude. Well, that's that. – you know, they could buy out the last couple years. Big deal. Well, that's what Big I mean. Like deal. they just extend No, them you're all wrong. Day. You didn't just sign an extension. <laughs> I almost got cold taked in a five second span. I'm back, baby. <laughs> He's back, baby. Listen, the hot takes are uh, back. I mean, listen. Uh, uh, the the extent he's closer to when the extension happened than when to the extension the when this extension will be over as sure. of this recording. So I would say he's more recently extended than more recently not going to be extended. But what's that's like? The, how are you just going to get rid of Andy Reid and then just restart, retool? You're going to keep Patrick Mahomes, so you want a new yeah, then, uh, yeah offensive. Travis Kelsey's going to be in a new team in 2023. Yeah, Travis Kelsey's a little bit too old. He's a guy that. Um, they're not going to be building around anymore, which is what makes their draft this year so fucking interesting because they're in that golden zone of like having picks in the 20s, multiple picks in the 20s in a year where they need wide receivers bad. And that's where you typically draft most of the wide receivers that aren't like the tier tier one guys. So they're going to land one or two big names in that spot. I just hope it's a good route runner because I feel like typically good route runners are ones that can get on the field and really help their offense produce like immediately where a lot of times 
explosive players seem to take a minute to to really hit their impact yep. on an NFL field. Um, so I would like a Jahan Dotson to go to KC. I think that would be a, a pretty nice little pairing where he can awesome. actually feel comfortable throwing him the ball. Um, I love that. I so love that. It's, and, and it's great for them, too, because this is generally across the board, position by position, a weak class. Anytime you see all these offensive linemen projected to go in the top 10, that you know it's a dead giveaway. It's a weak class. Going back to when Kansas City drafted Eric Fisher, right? When you have all these offensive linemen going in the top five. Why? Because it was a weak ass class, man. So if you just happen to need receiver this year and you're drafting in the 20s, you got lucky. If you need, you know, edge rusher, then it's going to be tougher, right? If you need quarterback, then you're going to be in trouble. Like, there's just different things. Like, uh, they lucked out there, but I just think that structurally they've done a relatively poor job of managing this Patrick Mahomes contract relative to all the other players on the team as opposed to what the Bills are doing, where the Bills seem to be building around Josh Allen perfectly. Just everything is on time, on schedule, strength on strength, and they should be a favorite to make the Super Bowl this year. So I I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Kansas City, why they they seem to be bad at team building um, compared to teams like the Bills, like the Chargers. I think the Chargers are going to win this division. I like uh, I like that take. I think it, I mean it's very very possible they have. Uh, I feel like we just call them up and coming every single year. But it's like with, with the Bills, they built around Josh Allen, and we're seeing a lot of teams do that, where they're just going all in on the offensive side of the ball to help their young quarterback. Because it's almost you know, <clears throat> it, Kansas City took the um, almost like the fantasy players approach, where it's like we have Patrick Mahomes he seals the biggest hole that an NFL team could have in the quarterback sure. and the rest of the petty shit will kind of take care of itself. But they took that probably to an extreme where it's almost like the nine, you know, the 80, 20 rule or the 90, 10 rule or 95, five rule where it's like, you know, you solve the one problem or you take care of the most important thing. And that gives you the results of everything else. But it's not like you can just drop the 90% in there and everything takes care of itself. And it feels like that's the direction they're going with KC. But they also did sign him to a 10-year or whatever the fucking deal was. So in the front office, they're starting to think about more longer-term moves, right? Like Tyreek Hill's out. They know Kelsey's probably on his way out. So it's like, let's start rebuilding for two years down the road when we still have Mahomes for seven years down the road. Uh, So it does seem to be like they're in a little bit of a rebuild mode. But it's also just hard to count out Patrick Mahomes at any point when you're comparing him to Derek Carr. It's like, this okay. This is what I'm saying. Yeah, I guess the more you say it out loud, the more reasonable it sounds that Casey's kind of on. They're on like a mini decline. He's going to fall off for a little bit, then he's going to drop another hit in two years, and then he's back, baby. He's it's back a like you were. It's not a rebuild. It's a retool. And if you need wide receiver, this is the, this is the class to get one. It's just too bad they already – signed Marquez Valdez Scantling in a panic move, right? You don't want to sign one-dimensional players while panicking. It's not a good idea. Like, that was the panic move of the offseason, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's like, dude, they just love these redundant wide receivers. Like, MVS is Demarcus Robinson, is Byron Pringle, is Nicole Hardman. It's like, we get it. Like, you want a guy to have a role, but, like, they also just don't have a role in your offense. Maybe they're thinking that they're going to have to disperse the ball around more than just Travis Kelsey and Tyree Kill and whoever replaces him, but that's certainly not the fucking way to do it with Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Yeah, but we're going to seemed... replace Tyree Kill with Nicole Hardman and MVS. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to have two guys. We're going to mash them together, and they're going to equal this one guy. And guess what? They don't even equal that one guy. Even if you added their production together, you wouldn't equal Tyree Kill's production. It's just, it's a debacle, man. That that team's a debacle. This draft class is a debacle. When you're looking at your rookie draft strategy, it, it's really a bummer if you have a mid-round pick. Like, if you have a mid, yeah, I mean, a mid-first rounder is just not what it was going to be six months, you know, six months ago 
you were feeling a lot better about it. Dude, yeah, it's almost like you said mid-rounder, but I'd almost rather have a bunch of mid-rounders than a mid-first-round pick because the combine basically solidified all of this unknown of these. You know, I, I'm in a league where I don't have my first-round pick, but I have a bunch of picks at like 206 to 312, and I'm fucking hyped about those guys because they're all in a tier together, and we just got confirmation from the combine that all of these mid-round running backs and a lot of these high-upside wide receivers just got a little bit closer to actually hitting that upside based on their athleticism. So it made so many of those mid round rookie running backs that much more like tantalizing. Um, I'm in a league where I had the 103, 104 and 112 and I got offered the 111, the three something and Davis Mills in a super flex for that 104. So I'm moving back seven spots I'll still be at the 111, so I'll have back-to-back picks there. I pick up a third-round pick, which I'm, like, weirdly excited about. Yeah. And I get Davis Mills. I don't know what the fuck Davis Mills is going to be, but listen, he's off to a better start than anyone would have projected. And this is where those random third, fourth, sixth-round quarterbacks in the NFL drafts come from, in the third, fourth, sixth round. And they play pretty well their first year, which is what he did given, like— the debacle in fucking Houston plus the lack of weaponry and him being able to come out there and actually show weekly upside gets me kind of excited. I mean, he, he averaged more like yards per game than a lot of the exciting rookie running backs or the exciting rookie quarterbacks coming into the class. So for me, moving from the 104 to the 111 was uh, like I did not really even think twice about it. It got me excited. I'm like, cool. There's like not really a defining tier once you get past like the first pick, the first two picks in the fucking rookie drafts this year, man. It's ugly. Our dynasty rankings – have the option to say include rookie picks. You can see where players are relative to their corresponding rookie picks. So in Superflex, picks are more valuable because the quarterbacks push down really good players into the early second round. That's why an early second rounder in Superflex is worth the same as, say, a Damian Harris or um, Alexander Madison or... Jacoby Myers, Pat Fryermuth, someone like that. Davis Mills is in that tier. So Davis Mills is between the 205 and the 206 in terms of super flex pick valuation this year. And there's not a big difference between the you know 104 and the 204 in super flex. Because there's a big three in Superflex, where you have the two running backs, Kenneth Walker and Brees Hall and Malik Willis. And then after that, there's a lot of sort of personal preference involved. And the same is true at the 103 in single quarterback, where you have Hall, you have Walker, and then it's dealer's choice. And whenever I have one of these dealer's choice picks, I'm trying to trade back, thinking, man, I might even get the guy I want anyway. Exactly. This is like you say, personal preference. We have not seen a draft class like this more personal preference wise in a long, just a couple months ago when there were people trying to be super cute and say like Brees Hall wasn't the RB one in this class. There was, you couldn't go position by position and, and have a consensus. uh, You couldn't have a consensus top guy at any position. There was just three or four months ago. There was not a consensus RB one. There was not a consensus QB one tight end one wide receiver one. It was all personal preference, which is, kills tears which literally destroys the first round rookie it makes it fun makes it fun for people that do have a very strong stance on players or have a better overall view of the class and this is one of the years where because it's like that and like we've narrowed down Brees hall to be the rb1 i would say there are probably still people over here that don't have kenneth walker as the two i would say there are people probably still arguing for spiller as the rb2 in some cases in terms of qb1 i just hope spiller gets drafted at this point uh, I saw that on the show sheet and I was like, all right, like, I, I guess P- Podfather wants to fucking uh, rile, rile up a few people on a fucking Tuesday morning. Hey, man, I'm riding with your boy. I Noah Hills, you. baby. I, dude, it was the first he video. He started he ever, it all. He did, dude. We're fucking ma- we're, we're, we're making the waves out here and people are just showing up to the beach with their fucking boogie boards, right? And saying that they were along for the ride. <laughs> Fuck no. They're Noah's riding our wake, baby. Yeah. Um, so there's just so much uncertainty here in terms of like who people like, which makes that like 104 to 112 range. You might like um, you might like Matt Corral 
enough to grab him at the 104 in Superflex leagues Great where point. I can grab him at the 111 <laughs> in a different Superflex league. Or if I like Sam Howell better, I can get him at the one. Like, it just, there's a lot of, like, craziness with this draft class. Which Jameson makes Williams back- could go at the 105 or he could go at the 205. Yeah, and draft cap will obviously be a big dictator, especially, yeah. like, Malik, what if Malik Willis ends up, um, there, I mean, most of the projection of him as QB1 and like the 102 or 103 in Superflex leagues is with the notion that he goes, you know, number two overall or even like top 12 in the NFL draft. What happens if he pulls the Lamar Jackson and goes 26 and Pickett and Corral both go 10 to 15 spots ahead of him? Then there's the debate of Malik Willis at the 102. Probably not anymore. I mean, maybe still, but like I think I, I think there's still not a lot of consensus concern. Uh, certainty yeah, he would, yeah, he would drop all. down probably behind Walker if that happened. Yeah, yeah, he exactly would. So he would. It would be Hall Walker at that point in Superflex, which is nuts because he's just so not a pure prospect at all, right? We had no. like Trevor Lawrence coming out, and you were you're like he's the QB one. Let's not like get weird about it. Let's not get cute. Like we know what we're getting out of this guy, or so we thought. But Malik Willis is one of those guys that we are sort of pumping up because we have. Like we're, we're so thirsty for certainty, and since we don't have it, we're squeezing the fucking water bottle out of anything that we can find. Right. If Malik Willis was in last year's draft class, he would have been a late first rounder. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Right? Maybe. If not, leaking into the second round. Because there were all these quarterbacks available, and then there was just jockeying, moving up to get Trey Lance, got to trade up to get Justin Fields. I don't, I don't see anybody trading up last year to get Malik Willis, but because he's now the only thing that really is is generating significant excitement among all the skill position players, among NFL executives, someone's going to trade up for him. I think that's what's going to happen. Someone's going to trade up into the top 10 to get him, whether it's the Steelers, whoever. I don't know. We'll see. It's, 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 it's going to be one of the, the most interesting elements about this year's first round is – who goes up and gets Malik Willis? That's going to be the big open question. I got to tell you though, dude, I am uh we we do something similar to what you guys do over there for the NFL draft where we're live streaming for like a bazillion fucking hours. This will be a tough one to get through in the first round. That first night because oh, there's yeah. a chance that like the top 15 players, there's like one or two offensive players. And it's like, we're sitting here with defensive linemen. I'm like, I don't give a fuck about defensive linemen, offensive tackle. What am I going to say? Like, okay, it improves this offense and makes the running back better because they added offensive linemen. It's like, there's no fantasy analysis to go along with all these defensive players and offensive linemen getting picked. So this is like... You got to bring your lifestyle year- picks. Yes, dude. We're, I, I, don't, I don't know what we're going to do for that long. We might just not have it this year. I'd be like, <laughs> let, me, let me know if an offensive player gets picked. We'll hop on for the draft for that 10 minutes. Come to Vegas with us. We're going to be in Vegas. Vegas. I, I, I rented a house in Vegas. So we have a house with a pool and a hot tub. So we'll be streaming from the house. But also, we've applied for credentials. And there's a red carpet. So I'm hoping that at least Cody and I can be on the red carpet interviewing guys. <laughs> you know, we're going to wear our suits and, and, and do the red carpet thing. And then we could broadcast from within the, the, the media row section. And then on... Friday and Saturday, we'll actually just sit down with Nate and Cody, and we'll, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll do a, a show show from the house. But we're we're gonna be in Vegas. We gotta be near the action, man. Like a, you know enough already. Uh, just watching from afar. Once I saw Cody get media credentials to go to like Malik Willis's pro day. It sort of inspired me. I was like, you know what? Let's start applying for more credentials. Let's let's just see. Let's just see. We're 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 developing into a, a you know our own media company. You know, I know NFL teams are using player profiler. I know NFL media is using player profiler. Why don't we just apply for credentials and and we'll show up and we'll interview these guys on the red carpet? Fuck it. I'm I, I'm now that you bring that up. I'm, one of my friends, a couple weeks or months ago asked me he was like yo can i use bg as like a a media credential thing to get i forget what he was even going to but i i never uh, my, my friend snacks who does some work for us i forget what he was going to but i'm pretty sure he was able to go wherever he was just by like dropping the name and using that as media credentials or something giants related maybe a pro day or some sort of workout or whatever yeah. that shit's funny but he, Cody go to has a game. To... he could go to a game and watch it from the the booth dude cody has to wear the uh 
this the the fit that he's got going on in in his Twitter profile yes. right now. Yes, with that with black on black with the with the gold chain. Yeah, if he doesn't wear that on the red carpet, y'all are fucking fired. Oh, you he better will. fire him. Oh, we won't. You're not gonna. We can't, you're not gonna fire us. We're gonna do the thing that you want us <laughs> to do. We're gonna deliver for the people. Nick, come on, you know that. Yeah, he was at the combine. So we are an established media organization with the NFL now. And he asked Kenny Pickett about his his baby hands. No one else would ask. So he was surrounded by all this Pittsburgh media, right? Legacy Pittsburgh media. And everyone was talking about his hands waiting for him to go up to the podium. And then none of these guys would ask him. They all instantly became cowards and wouldn't ask him the thing everyone was talking about. And Cody's sitting there like, hey, I'm new, and I'm not sure how this works, but uh, I'm going to give you guys a chance to ask him the thing everybody wants to know, and if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. It's like, What's so like your the hands, Pittsburgh dude? Gazette and everyone, they all just bailed, and Cody had to step up and ask the question. Everybody wondering. I don't know if like those types of newspapers like know that it's a thing though. Maybe that's why they didn't. No, no, he ask. said they did. Everyone uh, was talking about it. All the 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 old crusty newspaper guys were talking about the hands. It was it was a topic of conversation while they were waiting for him to show up, and then they just bailed and just you know served him up the softball questions. And Cody was like, "Are you guys serious? Do I have to do this for you?" This is my first combine. Really? Dude, shout out. Shout out to fucking Cody. Asking the questions that the streets need answers to. And then guess what? They played it on SportsCenter. <laughs> I actually, yeah, I did see that. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. It's like, hey, guys, um, you know, you can just ask the thing everyone wants to know, and then it'll go on SportsCenter. It's not hard. Do you like Pickett? I think Pickett's okay. I think he had a great year, and he probably would have had a better year the year prior uh, had everything gone his way. It's just not great to have eight-and-a-half-inch hands. It's just bad. It's bad. Now, I don't want to get caught doing what I did with Deshaun Watson and being dismissive because he had one of the weakest arms that we've ever seen in the database. And so, yes, he has the smallest hands. That's true. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you dismiss him altogether. So we still have him as our QB two. Uh, he's a you know got a lot of quality traits, prolific while taking care of the football with size and mobility. Those are all true. He's just quite old with the small hands and the late breakout. So th th there's a balancing act there. But I still think that he has more possibilities to excel and ascend than say a Matt Corral, uh, Sam Howell. Those guys seem to me to be destined to be backup quarterbacks in the league, to be more of the, on the case Keenum track. Uh, whereas, yeah, I could, I could absolutely close my eyes and see uh, Kenny Pickett being a Ryan Tannehill, but I think Ryan Tannehill is really his his ceiling. I think is this, but that's still better than I think a lot of guys. Uh, Ritter's there too, so Ritter has the upside of the mobility. When he goes out and runs a four or five, I'm like, oh god, right? And then you go back and you you look at the tape and you look at his stats from his senior year, and he's like, oh wow, he was almost as productive as Pickett, and he doesn't have some of these flaws, and he's more athletic. Oh no, right? So. Between Pickett and Ritter, it's very close for me. They they, yeah. they 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 all have upside, but so far away from being like a Trevor Lawrence level prospect, where you just know, hey, this is a premium player who's a, a very high likelihood of, of eventually reaching an upper echelon of the NFL. You can't come close to having that level of confidence with these prospects. They're just not yeah. the same thing, man. These are guys that are going in the first round this year who would have been second and third rounders in previous years. That's the best way I can explain this quarterback class to people. Yeah, as prospects, they're just not there. I'm in lockstep with Kenny Pickett, though. He is 
certainly my QB two, and um, it's got to be. When I yeah, when I watched him and honestly, him and Malik are not too far apart for me. Um, I will take Malik first, but draft capital will play a, a fucking role into how I see these guys and where I draft them in the rookie draft. I'm at the point where I just let the NFL dictate how how much I like a guy when it comes to rookie drafts and whether I'm taking them in the first round or the early second round, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Kenny Pickett, I like a lot more than I felt like the consensus was, but I feel like it's kind of tightened up a little bit where he is basically the consensus too. I, I don't see a lot of concerns in his gameplay per se, just watching him play, but the fact that he was at Pitt for five years and didn't really break out until the fifth year is a major red flag for me. Didn't um, come close, dude. Was a 3,000-yard yeah. passer, seven yards per attempt, 13 touchdowns, nine interceptions in consecutive seasons. He had 13 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Not special. That's through four years. Yeah. And then in year five, somehow the light comes on. And the light's allowed to come on at some point. And it did happen. So we have to give him credit for that. And I, I, and I love his size. You know, I love... 6'3", 220, and was a, a true leader of men for his team. Ritter, same thing. So I like that. I like that about those guys. But, uh, again, these are players and traits that you'd be talking yourself into on day two in previous years. And I have to keep coming back to that. And whatever NFL team, and there could be multiple NFL teams that trade up for quarterbacks – it's going to be a sucker play and it's going to be a huge mistake. He's uh he's very athletic too. He's like underratedly really athletic in like a, not like a, a, he moves great around the pocket. And I think he's actually going to have a nice little fantasy floor when it comes to rushing, not in like a, like a Lamar Jackson way, obviously, but in the same way, that like Mahomes is really mobile and athletic and can randomly add in like 32 rushing yards on, on, uh, on a given game. That's kind of how I see Kenny Pickett. He's got a really strong arm, not necessarily like, super deep um, and like perfect touch on deep balls, but like the velocity is there. And I think velocity is really important when you're a guy that scrambles a lot, right? Because that helps you with the pinpoint accuracy. When you're rolling out of the pocket and you have a really, really strong arm, it's much easier to be accurate when you're outside of the pocket. And I think Kenny Pickett brings that, but yeah, dude, like the, the fifth year breakout is concerning um, in 2020. He was kind of on pace for a breakout too. He did get a high ankle sprain, which made him miss like three or four games. And then after that, obviously the production dips pretty heavily. So we could have, we could have had like two years of a pretty big breakout play had it not been for the high ankle sprain. So I don't want to write it off um, just, you know, concretely on that realm, but I like picking a lot more than Ritter. Ritter scares me a little bit in terms of his accuracy. Uh, I think he's like pretty fucking wild when it comes to his consistent accuracy. And then when we saw him on, you know, on the big scale against good teams, you play on Cincinnati, you're playing against, you know, some pretty whack competition. And then you get on TV against Alabama and you just look miserable. It's, uh, it's really hard to come back from that. So Ritter obviously has the wasn't upside, a good but, like, thrower at the senior bowl either. He could be like Daniel Jones, right? Where there's just com perpetual rushing upside. Yep. And like maybe it becomes a thing, but like how many years do you give him to excel as a passer before you're like, ah, fuck. Important thing on Kenny Pickett is that the athleticism matters more than the rushing yards when you're trying to project them for fantasy football. You can't get caught in this Zach Wilson trap where you're chasing the rushing production in college because a lot of that is derived from the system in college. So... Travis Etienne was just getting the dump-offs from Lawrence. Lawrence didn't need to uh, rush a lot in his final year, right? Travis Etienne had like 50-plus catches. Lawrence ran for less than 200 yards. But Lawrence is more athletic than Zach Wilson. Lawrence in his career is going to rush for a hell of a lot more yards than Zach Wilson ever will. But the rushing numbers didn't tell that story in college. The athleticism did. And it's the same in this class where you have a Sam Howell running a 5 40 putting up 800 rushing yards. Doesn't mean a goddamn thing. Meanwhile, Pickett, not necessarily a big runner in college, but the athleticism showed, oh, this guy's going to be pulling it down and running quite a bit in the NFL, and that's going to help fantasy football players who have this guy. Yeah, that's why I feel like he has a little more upside than he's getting credit for. I think uh, most people look at this class and they just say, like, ah, oh, these are all floor players. These are bottom-level players. And in terms of prospects, yes. 
But in terms of upside, I think there's a little bit more upside in this class because Pickett's more athletic than giving credit for. Uh, Desmond Ritter running a 4-5-3. And you have Sam Howell, who came out and ran for a fucking unbelievable amount of yards this year. And it, it's very explainable, like, the dip off in passing production, right? He loses all the weapons. Like, you've had the, the narrative at this point is pretty tired, right? Deami Brown's out, Javante Williams, Michael Carter, uh, yeah, sure. whoever yeah, uh, yeah, the other guys are out, yeah, whatever. It's yeah, like, yeah, you, yeah, you can sure. explain that away. yeah. yeah. Sure. You show me yeah. all these different fucking aspects of Sam Howell as a quarterback, right? He took it on his shoulders. Like he said, okay, I don't have the weapons anymore. How do I continue to execute this offense? How do I continue to push them forward? How do I continue to make plays? I'm going to use my legs for it. So I think there's a lot of upside with a guy like Howell too. Um, so, so it's kind of intriguing. We're probably making up more narratives than need to be made up at this point. And a lot of these guys probably would be way worse prospects in every other class. But I think there's some money to be made out there if you can, uh, if you can evaluate these guys correctly. And it's just a shame that some of these running backs we're relying on to be first rounders flame out in such epic. It's just Kyron Williams comes in with a four seven and everyone pretty quickly came to Jesus and be like, okay, okay. He's not a first rounder. Okay. He, he may not get drafted, right? We don't know. Does the NFL even think this guy's anything? I mean, his ceilings now James White. Which is fine, but that's the ceiling. Yeah, the, the ceiling's James White, and the floor is uh, who was the guy from Louisville last year? Who didn't go. Who didn't get drafted? Javian Hawkins. Javian Hawkins. So yeah. he goes from he's either James White or Javian Hawkins. He's somewhere on that spectrum. Okay, well that sucks. <laughs> that's too bad, right? Uh, Isaiah Spiller. There's some anchoring happening. Where it's like, well, geez, we did have this guy as our RB2. Some of us had him as our RB1. It's a little bit harder to uh, push this guy into the third round of rookie drafts. But he's just not a player. I don't think he, he's a guy I want. I'm not going to have any of him. I can tell you that. From the anchoring I'm seeing, he's still going to go late first, second round of Dynasty rookie drafts. And I'm completely out at that. ADP. He's definitely going to be a first round pick. Like when, when I tell you, well, we don't know where he's going to get drafted though. We don't know if he falls out of the third round, that could precipitate some additional coming to Jesus. (laughs) Oh, he's well, here's the thing with this class as well, because there's so much uncertainty at running back behind the first two, because there's so much uncertainty at quarterback, because no one cares about the tight ends in this class it makes those wide receivers who we know are really good players and they are, I don't want to say flawless across the board, but there are a lot of awesome prospects that make you feel way safer about taking Jameson Williams, George Pickens, Jahan Dotson, Sky Moore, like those guys where you might have said like, ah, maybe Isaiah Spiller, ah, maybe Rashad White, ah, maybe, you know, Zamir White, like these guys where you just don't do that. Like it's a very, very easy switch up based on the draft capital here. And I think, Outside of Spiller going in like the second round, which I still think might be a possibility because, again, like NFL execs don't look at the same shit that we're looking at as fantasy players. If he goes second round, it's a Ronald Jones situation. I could see it. I think he brings – he has a lot of traits where he can back himself into a really usable fantasy role, right? He is a pass catcher, and he has the size. If he's in a good offense, that could lead to 50 catches and then 15 goal lines, very much like James Conner, where it's like you can continue year over year saying that, like, he's not that good of a player, he's not that good of a prospect, but in the right situation, he can back himself into a very, very lucrative fantasy spot, But that is not long term thinking. Right. That is like, okay, we're thinking right now about this. And that seems to be like a lot of the running the running backs in this class where they're not great all around prospects. They have the size and maybe they have the long speed. But what you need for that is like your guy like Jerome Ford. Right. Two hundred ten pounds can run under a four or five. But he's not. He doesn't have it when it comes to lateral speed. He's not a very, like, bursty player. He's probably not going to contribute too much to third downs. But if you put him in an offense that produces a lot of fucking points that gives him big holes, he can hit that runway and make it big time. Yeah. There's just too many of those guys who don't make things happen on their own in this class. Right. We need to know where they're going and when they're going. Yeah. Right. So a lot of these guys are in this no man's land in the rankings and in the tiers because we just don't know. We have no idea what the NFL really thinks about Pierre Strong, mm-hmm. right? We have no idea what they think about Kevin Harris. I don't know. We'll see. 
right? I have a better idea of what they think of Damian Pierce and James Cook, but I also know that those are fairly underwhelming players for different reasons, right? So James Cook doesn't quite have the size. If James Cook was bigger, then I'd be a lot more excited. If Damian Pierce was more productive or more athletic, I'd be more excited. But He could easily go in the third round. I can see both James Cook and Damian Pierce going third round ahead of a Harris, a Strong, a Ford, players that we believe are better prospects. And if we were running NFL teams, we would have ranked higher, but we're not the NFL. So we have to kind of play this game where we're looking at mock drafts versus what we think. And then as it turns out from... Brian Robinson all the way down through Damian Pierce, they're all just jumbled up. And whatever happens during the draft is going to decide who rises and who falls as uh, that particular tier shakes out into multiple tiers. But we just don't know. And and that was that's actually the case of why our draft kit is free. So our draft kit is free right now on the website. And then after the draft, it's going to go behind the paywall because we know that the cheat sheets are going to be shifting dramatically after the draft. And then you're going to need to be subscribed to Dynasty Deluxe. You might as well get Dynasty Deluxe now because eventually the draft gets going to go behind there. And whatever the cheat sheet said before the draft, you might as well just throw those papers up in the air. They're not really useful anymore. That's just the way it works. And it's also... Part of the reason why I'm so underwhelmed by this class, because typically you'd have more running backs that are jumping up throughout the process and seizing the day. And it's clear from the buzz, the mock drafts, hey, these six running backs are going to go. And here's probably where they're going to go and when they're going to go. And here, other than Hall and Walker, fuck if I know, man. It's going to be a horrible first round, but second, third, fourth round is going to be very, very fun as it concerns rookie drafts. It seems like, again, this is one of those situations where we're so thirsty for things to happen and things to be exciting that we continue to push guys like like Brian Robinson up the board. And like my first pure take on B-Rob was watching him just like just so uninspiring as a player. But then it's like, OK, 225, 453, 40. He could. And then he caught a lot of passes. And I'm just like I'm, 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 I'm becoming robotic with the way I'm looking at this class. And I'm like, this is not the way that this should be done. And in any other class, I wouldn't be as excited. And it's also such a weird class because. For the last few years, we've been thirsting for these big body guys that give us some kind of glimpse of maybe a three down upside. Whereas last year, you know, we're like, oh, Kenny Gainwell. We're like stretching and reaching for like these little parts of these players games that we like. Like, oh, he's got elite breakaway speed. Oh, he can catch passes. Oh, he could do this. But we never felt real good about their upside where now it's like we're seeing a bunch of mediocre running backs have the size or have these like individual traits that we think can hit that ceiling, but they're just not ceiling type players. So I don't know, dude, the more I, uh, the more I think about these wide receivers in this rookie class, the more I'm like, fuck, we probably need to get those ones early. Cause everything after these early wide receivers is just such a shakeout. Yeah. Typically we would be saying draft Brian Robinson. That's what we do. You want to get your running backs early, especially in the first round, running back. But no, no, I'm saying go Jamison Williams, go George Pickens. Don't do that. Instead, this is a weird year where where the second round historically has been the best place to get wide receivers in rookie drafts. I can absolutely see myself going running back in the second round and starting with a wide receiver, like drafting a Pickens, drafting an Olave, drafting a Garrett Wilson, and then just stockpiling running backs in rounds two through five of rookie draft, which I've never done. But the more I look back at previous success I've had, the more I'm like, okay, well, I need to be focusing on running back in round three, four, five, so I can hit on the next Khalil Herbert the next Chuba Hubbard, not even talking about the next Elijah Mitchell, right? The next Gainwell. That's typically a win over 
a, a wide receiver that was going at a similar ADP that barely saw the field. Right? I mean, I had a situation last year. My biggest mistake I made in a rookie draft that I saw was I drafted uh, Seth Williams over <laughs> Khalil Herbert. And that was just a mistake. That was just a mistake. Like, I, I, I thought I was good at running back. I thought I needed a receiver. What are you doing, man? Like, you just got to forget need altogether and just take the next running back on your board in the fourth and fifth round especially. That's my strategy. And I, I, I the more I look back at, at past success, trying to learn from mistakes, that's where I've uh, you know, now positioned myself. Dude, that, that league I was talking about before where I traded back for Davis Mills, in that league I have the, the 103, 11, and 12. There's, I would say there's like a 90% chance I walk away from that rookie draft with three wide receivers in those spots. I had three, I'm going to be able to get. Or like, trade choice, back or get, end up with a 2023 yeah. first rounder. Yeah, that's probably what I should do. But if I don't, it'll probably be wide receivers or a quarterback that falls to me at the 112 or something. But if I walked away with like Garrett Wilson, Jamison Williams, and even Chris Olave, pair the fucking wide receivers and hope you one of them goes to the fucking moon. Yeah, yeah, even Pickett back there or one of the other guys if they somehow sneak into Pickett the first Ritter, round of the NFL man. draft. That's what I'm going to be shooting for in those areas other than wide receiver. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the sweet spot for, you know, and then you can always flip that guy. He might get an opportunity, flash in a few games, and because he has the first round capital, you just have to remember six months from now what that guy really is and flip him. So if, if for example, Ritter flashes i'd be trading him right that would be the move but uh, yeah if you have a bunch of picks my goal would be to at least trade out of one of those and also end up with a value quarterback and one of these wide receivers that would be i think a, a good haul a good goal yeah, there's there's no run like I I have liked Rashad White throughout the process as much as anybody has like he was my RB four months ago and hasn't really changed from the combine but there's no chance I'm sitting at one twelve and I'm taking Rashad White over Chris Olave or any of those wide receivers in that range because he's too old there's too many uncertainties in his prospect profile and then it's like once you get down to the two oh seven it say you have five picks from the two oh seven to the three twelve you could literally walk away with you know Zamir White. And Kevin Harris and Damian Pierce and Calvin Austin, and Calvin Austin and Keontae Ingram. Like you could run away with like four running backs that all have some legit upside to them. And that's what makes these mid rounds like kind of fun from the running back position, but horrible earlier on in the draft. If you don't have the 101 in Brees Hall or the 103 in Kenneth Walker, it gets ugly really, really quickly. So move back because next year's class is a um, thing of beauty relative to this one, at least. Which is what they said about this class last year. Fair, but I mean, compared to last year, I mean, it, it could really I mean, only go up. There's no way. There's no way that next year's Kyron Williams is going to run a four seven, and that Isaiah Spiller is going to duck the forty. That's the next year's class is more robust. It, it absolutely is. I'm, I'm telling you that with with complete and utter certainty. The wide receiver five is tricky for us. Pickens versus Jamison Williams, because especially Jamison Williams, had he not torn his ACL, wouldn't be a conversation. But because of that torn ACL and the uncertainty that that brings with it, the draft capital uncertainty because of that, there's also Pickens and his injury history that he doesn't have like a, a complete season on his resume that you can look at and say, oh, well, you know, this is his upside. They're both young. They both just turned 21 years old. Who you got between those two? Very tight. They are my five and six, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah they got to be. I have Jamison Williams as the five, and this might be projecting higher draft capital um, because I'm a sh almost definitely Williams is going before Pickens in the NFL draft. I think the question is, like, how early does Jamison Williams go? I just think he's a more... I think he's got higher upside than Pickens, and I think a lot of people disagree with me on that. I've heard a lot of hype uh, about George Pickens. For me, when I see Pickens, I see more of a really elevated role player in the mold of, like, Mike Williams, 
Chase Claypool, even like a Devontae Parker esque type player. He is very similar to Parker, yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't see like a wide receiver one alpha upside where I think in that case I'd rather just break the tie with Jamison Williams, who could be like a game breaking player. I know a lot of people you look at Williams and you just think speed, but he's a very pure route runner. He's also not that small. I think he's six one, one ninety. Like that is plenty of size. He's not coming in here with Devonta Smith size where we were concerned about that. But I think as long as you have some sort of size, either lengthwise or thickness wise, you're going to be fine. And honestly, like 190 pounds is if I'm saying this correctly, if that is actually his weight, like six, one, one ninety is a very solid build for someone who probably would have ran like a four, three, five. Um, so Williams, I feel like he's got a little bit more of a tantalizing upside to him where an offense is going to build around him where I see Pickens being more of a complimentary 2A or 1B in an offense. I just think that that rookie year for Pickens is just too tantalizing. It really is. And these Alabama helmets, man, they have a bad track record. I mean, Jalen Waddle, thank God, right? If not for Jalen Waddle, just be disappointment back through time till who knows. Now you could consider Calvin Ridley a disappointment. Uh, yeah. Amari Cooper's been incredibly inconsistent year to year. I don't know, man. I don't know. But I, but I what I do like, though, is the SEC. I like that both these guys are in the SEC. This, this gives me a lot of comfort that when you look at Elijah Moore, for example, from last year, and, of course, when Brown and Metcalf came out, to it, succeeded against that level of competition and not just that level of competition, but also with your dominator rating against other quality players on your own roster, right? To, to rise above other quality players. It's a big deal, right? So that, that that's why we just generally prefer these sec talents as opposed to any, anyone from any other conferences. What about sleepers? Just give us one sleeper. You mentioned, uh, one running back, Keontae Ingram, and that's also who, no surprise, Noah Hills likes. Do you have someone else, a sleeper? I have a yeah, I have a few names that I throw out there. Um, I guess I don't know if they're actually like sleep. Like Jalen Tolbert's probably not a sleeper at all in the dynasty community, but I absolutely <laughs> fucking love that dude. I he's will say uh, he's just a beast. He's Talk a beast. about a guy that's going to be plug and play in year one, Jalen Tolbert. Dude, he is just ready to be a right possession receiver at the next level. Like, I I would be shot. You guys fucking nailed it with Adam Thielen as the comp. I was trying to think of the comp, and then I saw that, and I was like, oh, like, doesn't necessarily excel at anything, but is just so good, like, well-rounded uh, at just about every aspect of the game. So, Jalen Tolbert, I love. But a couple other deeper guys, I, I loved Kenny We have a knack Brooks. for these comps, by the way. Yeah, I mean, you guys are pretty, <laughs> pretty fucking good at him, bro. <laughs> um, Kennedy Brooks... C.J. Verdell, Bo Melton are three guys that I really, really like. Let's talk about Bo Melton because I 100% agree on Bo Melton. Man, is that dude fucking fast. He's really good. I think he's just a good football player, and he's going to get on a team right away. He's going to be in the active roster on day one, came in super athletic. He also, yeah, he's 189, but at 5'11", 189, that's a good, solid BMI. 189 is fine. 189 yeah. is like not a question of being too small anymore. And that, when that's George honestly bigger than 6'3", 189, that's a spelt <laughs> dude. Yeah. But uh, Melton's a very exciting player, man. Just like so, so athletic. And he's one of those players like the if used correctly, which is basically the conundrum of most arguments for most rookies. But a lot of times it's like people making arguments for like if he's used correctly – but then they're still not going to hit. I'm pretty confident if Bo Mil- Melton gets the chance at the next level, if used correctly, he's going to be really fucking good because he's got enough size and he certainly has uh, the athleticism across the board. Coming out of Rutgers is obviously like a weird, you know, a weird, uh, I guess. It's a handicap, part of- man. It's like coming out of Michigan yeah. the last few years. Like a, this is a Donovan Peoples-Jones situation where he's good in special teams. He's super athletic, but he was just recruited by the wrong school. Like this is a yeah. Donovan Peoples Jones situation, and I and I and I like him. The problem is, I'm gonna have a guy like this. This happens to me every year. I'm gonna have a guy like this that slips into the later rounds of the rookie draft, and I'm gonna have this mantra in my head going, 
running back, 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 running back. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the running back button and be like, oh, but I love Mel Melton at the last yeah. minute. And it's probably going to be a mistake just because you got to follow your your positional process knowing that, sure, Melton will probably be on an active roster, but the circuitous route for him to actually get significant targets is tricky. Whereas a running back, even if he's the third running back, like Khalil Herbert last year, as it turns out, it's pretty straightforward for a guy like that to end up in the starting lineup pretty soon. It's the running yeah, back I don't position. It's, it's, the, it's, how it, it's how it works. There aren't that many intriguing later round wide receivers, which make this a little bit of an easier class for me to uh, to pass on when we're in like the late third, early fourth round. I mean, you can make the case for some of these guys, but like you have Bo Melton there. Um, I tell you what, if there's going to be a bust at the wide receiver position from Alabama, it's it's definitely going to be John Mechie. I that guy. Uh, uh. He, he just wasn't there. It wasn't there for me when I was watching him play. Um, I think he's, I think he's a slot wide receiver with explosiveness. Uh, when he's on the outside and and running routes like a normal wide receiver, he does not separate well whatsoever. And I was actually writing up some stuff on him because I was using him in one of my videos next week. Mm. I, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I was looking at yards per out run in the slot versus outside. And it was a ama- It was almost like 2.5 yards per route run difference when he's in the slot versus on the outside. And I was like, okay, that matches what I see. Cause he's an explosive guy. Like over the middle, of course he could separate really quickly because slot cornerbacks don't typically like play right on top of you and whatever. But um, he's a guy that I just, it just wasn't really there for me when I watched him. So I think Mechie's going down that Alabama uh, kind of path of, of that we've seen over the last few years. I would like nothing more than to move Melton ahead of Mechie on our rankings. But because the projected draft pick is just so different, mm-hmm. where Mechie's in the top 100 in these mocks, you know? So that's the only thing. Like, just so people know, like, the underlying mechanics of what's driving these lifetime value ratings on Player Profiler, that's a big part of it, right? And it's going to be a lot harder for Melton if he's a day three pick versus Mechie as a day two pick, if it changes, and for whatever reason, Melton gets drafted, let's say in the third round, and Mechie is a late second round or something like maybe that's how it plays out, then that's where you'll see those guys flip. But until then, until we have a sense for how the NFL views Melton, we just can't get too far out over our skis on that one. Yeah, no. Very few scenarios where where you can actually where you can practically flip them and be like, yeah, this was the right move. Yeah, we we can't. We just we try to not go crazy. We have you know we have some strong positions, and you can see in in the rankings where those strong positions are. But it, you know we strive to make sure that the processes are, are in place so that you're never going. Oh, there's something crazy, or there's something weird, or there's something that they're not seeing or there's something broken with their formulas or whatever it is. Like we, 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 you know, we have huge attention to detail to make sure that almost every place you're seeing a player slotted in, or you're seeing a lifetime value rating that it passes the smell test. So let's just zoom out a little bit, thinking about just dynasty more broadly. Cause I think that's all we're really going to talk about today is like, the business and dynasty, and that's really all people want to hear about anyway, really. It's the way it should be, yeah. Yeah, so who are you trying to acquire right now in dynasty? Who am I trying to acquire? So I guess we could start with more uh, like high level, or I, there's there's three players I kind of wrote down that I think I should that people should be targeting right now. It is Eno Benjamin, Michael Pittman, and Zach Wilson. Those are my three guys right Good. now, and they're, I think they are levels of, of um, value that I think are differing, where they're like different levels. Like, you know, Benjamin, you should be able to treat. He's probably he might be on your fucking waiver wire. You could probably throw a fourth round pick at him or something. But with Jay Edmonds gone, you know, Benjamin's one of those guys whose like profile as a college player is. I mean, it, it honestly it was like eerily similar to like Aaron Jones, where he could be a three down back. And if he gets the Chase Edmonds role this year, he's going to have a ton of value um, on your fantasy team. We don't know what James Conner is is going to if he's going to hold up this year that could be a role where he sees a significant play time that you're getting for literally no price whatsoever Dead zone. Michael, 
James yes. Conner is the quintessential dead zone back. If you built a dead zone running back in a lab, he would be James Conner. Michael Pittman. Is, Michael Pittman's awesome. I fucking love Michael Pittman. And I had, I had been writing up something for him because I was like, he's a guy that I'm uh, I'm not trading. If I own him in Dynasty, he's someone that I'm keeping on my team for the long term. And then I heard a podcast between two of your boys, Josh Larkey and um, – and Cody, and they, I mean, the, the episode was named Michael Michael Pittman Route Tactician, I think. And they were talking about some of the advanced numbers that you guys are working on and how Michael Pittman just crushed across the board, success versus man versus zone, just overall success rate versus coverage, just dominated it. And you're looking at Matt Ryan coming in, and I'm not high on Matt Ryan right now whatsoever. He's got a fucking noodle for an arm. But if you look at how the targets are dispersed, Matt Ryan historically, like whoever is his number one, going back to the Roddy White days 10 years ago, Roddy White was averaging 160 targets per season. Then Julio Jones came in 170. Calvin Ridley, 150, 160. Michael Pittman, not only a fantastic receiver, as we could see by the numbers that you guys like display and, and torture over to get out to us, but just the situation that they're now in, him being the complete alpha there like he had a great year despite Carson Wentz being outside of like the top 25 and basically every type of accuracy rating out there no, so the fact that he Wentz can come fucked in him bad man 85 catches over a thousand yards like dude you have a guy that can actually deliver you the ball Michael Pittman's gonna go to the fucking moon this year and I don't think he's like that that difficult to acquire in dynasty right now he'll be a wide receiver one and he was like the wide receiver 17 last year he'll be a wide receiver one this year if he takes just a tiny tiny step up so you have Michael Pittman and then Zach Wilson very much to the argument for um, like Josh Allen or any of these teams where at worst, the team is doing their best to build around this player. And I've always thought this. I've always said that, like, if you're not on one end of the spectrum when it comes to accuracy as a passer, if you're not pinpoint or if you're not really, really bad, how good you are as a fantasy player is going to be dictated by the weapons around you. And with Zach Wilson, they're doing everything they can to try to build around him, yes. right? They are. That's you know, why I like him. Exactly. And he might not be good. He might be terrible, and this might flame out. But if you go by the process and you look at what they're doing around him, they're trying to give him the running backs. They're trying to give him the wide receivers. They're trying to give him the offensive line, which they've been building up the last few years. And now, I mean, almost every mock I see is uh, like Drake London to the Jets at oh, 10. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, they're giving him every opportunity to succeed. So – that's that's all you can ask for from a fucking uh, a young quarterback. And he is the least prized guy out of the class that came out last year. It's Trevor Lawrence. It's Mac Jones. It's Justin Fields. It's Trey Lance. Anyone would take all four of those guys over Zach Wilson. So he's the most acquirable in a position where he didn't. I mean, he wasn't good last year. I'm not going to whip out some crazy numbers unless I think I wrote some shit down. But from player profiler accuracy rating number nine last year, deep ball completion rate number six last year, number two overall in drop passes from his weapons while missing a month of the season. There I mean, the go. numbers are there. The weapons are there. They're building around him. Go get Zach Wilson and then come yell at me next year when he fucking flames out. If you're a content creator on any platform and you're not pulling up these player pages, you're fucking up. Okay? Thanks. You're missing out. You look at Michael Pittman. We just added today a new section on wide receivers two new sections on quarterbacks advanced accuracy uh and uh zone versus man for quarterbacks and then we had a zone versus man section for wide receivers michael Pittman, number three in total route wins and number two in route win rate because they didn't throw a lot in indianapolis but his other numbers are all lagging. Why? Because Carson Wentz struggles to throw it accurately to the outside. It's that Baker Mayfield-itis that he caught from Derek Carr, that he caught from Jimmy Garoppolo, that Tua also has. Like, all these guys, like, all these quarterbacks are on, they, they have some level of difficulty throwing outside the numbers. And one thing we know about Matt Ryan is he doesn't have that difficulty. He doesn't have that disease. He has other flaws, right? He has no mobility, and his arm strength is starting to fade. But his accuracy to the outside, his willingness to push the ball to the perimeter, to the boundary, is there. I mean, Julio Jones, hello, right? Like, this is the guy that helped elevate Julio Jones to the Hall of Fame. So I'm very comfortable now with uh, what we're going to be getting from um, my man Michael Pittman. Now, who are you trying to offload in Dynasty? 
Man, so I did uh, a video on this a couple months ago about it was like five running backs that you need to get off your roster in Dynasty ASAP. The first one on there was Clyde edwards helaire uh, and this was prior prior to the Ronald Jones signing. Unfortunately, you probably can't get much for him. But like, if you can get anything for the name value, if you can get an early second round pick for Clyde edwards helaire you're doing that ASAP. You uh, have I to think- wait now. Unfortunately, yeah. Once Ronald Jones signed, now you have to wait for him to have a good game. So you have to wait like five months. I mean, he's gonna yeah, have a tough. good game. He will have one good game. So just make sure you deal him after that. I'm dealing Aaron Jones as well. Um, I think that uh, he'll be a fine RB2 probably this year. And he probably gets even more of a boost in in value and production now that Devontae Adams is gone because the splits in terms of, like, targets are really high when Devontae Adams is not on the field. But there is no – like, we saw exactly what this split in the Green Bay backfield is going to be last year. They showed it, too. They showed us their cards – And there's no reason that they're going backwards and saying, okay, you know what? AJ Dillon, take a seat. Like if you look at the numbers from weeks, I think like three through 16, there was one blowout game that Aaron Jones had really early in the season. If you look at the week after that until the end of the season, the per touch numbers were almost exact. It was like 11 carries a game for Dillon, 10 for Aaron Jones. Targets were a little higher in favor of Aaron Jones, but AJ Dillon dominated the goal line work. And that's a big concern because that's where Aaron Jones was really, you know, making his money over the previous few years because he was rushing in 12, 13, 14, 15 touchdowns uh, a year because he was getting so much goal line opportunity. That's at worst 50% A.J. Dillon's now. I'm just looking at this. It's very, very obvious what Aaron Jones is right now, and it is a part of a committee. It might be a good committee. He might have weekly upside. Yeah, it's, but it's, ta- Aaron Rodgers is there. Like, we, you got lucky, right? If you have Aaron Jones, you have to feel lucky. They dump Devontae Adams, but they have Aaron Rodgers back for multiple seasons. So you got lucky, right? If those two things didn't happen and worst case scenario, Rogers is gone, but they franchise tag Devonte Adams. You're not going to get nearly as much back for Aaron Jones. So just take the win and dump him now, knowing that he's many years older than AJ Dillon. AJ Dillon's not yet 24, And Aaron Jones is well past age 27. So, yeah, we're talking about at least a, what, a three and a half year difference in age? He's out of Green Bay after next year, too. The way the contract is set up, they save $11 million by cutting him after 2023. That's going to be Dylan's backfield. And then who the fuck knows where Aaron Jones ends up? So he did that to himself. He accepted mm -hmm. the restructure. He took extra money. I don't remember exactly what the number was. I think it might have been $5 million. It was a good amount of money that he took up front in order to ensure that he was going to be gone in a year. So, yeah, there's always a price, right, to restructure and likely be gone in the following season, lose your security. You have to pay a price, and there's always a price to be paid, and and that's where agents come in and they negotiate it with the team. and, And he said, yeah. You know what? I'll bet on myself. I'll take the money and I'll bet on myself. That's what he's doing. And good for him. That's all good stuff, right? But he's gone and he's 27 and he's a running back. Sell. Yeah. You move, go Aaron Jones in a second round pick for some much younger running back that has more upside. And that's how you continue to replenish your, your, uh, your dynasty team. And then one other guy I'm probably selling is you could get Michael Carter. That's an interesting one. Yeah. You would take Michael Carter over Aaron Jones? No, but I would take Michael Carter in a second for Aaron Jones. Yeah, that that's probably exactly where the line is. So I think if you're comfortable with that trade, that's easily something that you can get done. That's I think it. you could probably throw around offers for even more high upside guys. Maybe someone who has Travis Etienne that's worried about the Liz Frank injury. Maybe oh, go yeah, Aaron yeah, Jones. You, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't start there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> that's the that's the baseline. You'd be the worst like, negotiator. You would start in the world, with Etienne, yeah. and then if you can't get Etienne. You eventually work your way down. Like, okay, Elijah Mitchell, no. Okay, Michael Carter, okay. Exactly, and that's what you start doing with Aaron Jones right now. I'd also get rid of Rashad Penny. If you can get, like, an early second for Rashad Penny right now, there's there's too much hype around Rashad Penny as the player, which is 
you know, which is okay. Like I'm okay with you liking him as a player, but objectively the situation is so fucking bad. The situation is so bad there without Russell Wilson right now that like, do you really want a guy that one is not even a three down player? He barely caught any passes when he was breaking out at the end of last year. It's pure. It's a team. Yeah, it's a team that's going to be trailing a lot without Russell Wilson. They were already a fucking terrible team last year with Russell Wilson. So without him, I mean, how bad is this team going to be if he's not the third down pass? Ca- like, dude, there's nothing about this situation that I like. And if you can get him off for the fucking 203 or 204, replace Penny for Rashad White or something like that, boom. The reasons why we like Javante Williams and Chase Edmonds are the reasons why you got to run and hide from Rashad Penny. Situation-based, a lot of running back production, especially year-to-year in seasonal leagues and best ball, it's situational. And the problem in Dynasty is, like, Penny's already passed the AJ Pecks. So really, all you have really going for him is this key, This year is everything in Dynasty. And if this year is everything and it's not shaping up to be a productive year, sell. My truther that I have in every league is Ashton Doolin. And Ashton Doolin got a quarterback upgrade, and they've shed a bunch of wide receiver talent. So he's rose up the depth chart just by default. So things are really working in his favor, not as much as Michael Pittman's favor. So for a lot of the same reasons I like Pittman, I also like Doolin. But who are you truthering for where this guy's available in Dynasty, he's on the waiver wire, he's on your taxi squad just because? Do you have any guys like that? Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's definitely Eno would be number one, but I'll give you an even worse running back right now that's going to get zero touches this year. And for whatever reason, I still really like him. Run AMC, Mr. Anthony McFarland, dude. I can't fathom why he's not getting work above Benny Snell. Every time I watch him play, he's explosive. He brings something to the field that Benny Snell does not. And he's never going to step on the field now that Najee Harris takes 100% of the touches and the volume and the opportunity. But McFarland could be like such a nice role player in an offense that brings explosiveness and brings a third down ability to the field. Um, and I'm such a fraud because I, I think I literally just dropped him in one of my leagues it's to make so room for a trade. Because if you were doing what's right for the team, even what's right for Najee Harris, just listen to Austin Eckler talk about his need to you know, take some plays off, even some series off. Like He's honest. He's one of the few running backs that's honest with the public, honest with his teammates, with his coaches. If Najee Harris wants to do what's in the best interest of Najee Harris, he'll have that hard conversation too, but he shouldn't even need to because the coaches should already know that the optimal plan would be to cap a guy at a 70% opportunity share and give the rest to the guy with the 4-4 wheels. In a perfect world, Matt. In a perfect world, my truther wouldn't have to be labeled as a truther. I know. So now you have to be a truther. The great thing is he came out super early from Maryland and fourth-round pick, so he has – like Michael Carter level draft capital and he could latch on somewhere else. We see this with Mike Davis. There's, there's been players that have come along drafted in the fourth round, but because of that, they couldn't latch on initially. And then in their second, third team, they break out. And if you're in a deep enough league, you might as well just hold on to him. I like it. Uh, We'll move him up. That's a guy I can move up. Let's go. Give me a bold prediction. I'll we'll get you out of here. Okay. My bold prediction is that someone's going to offer you an eight figure deal to buy player profiler from you in the next two years. Wow. Really? Woo. It's going to be me. I I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. Interesting thing about, I think, player profiler is that when people go to player profiler, it it feels like a spaceship, and it doesn't fit neatly into any one bucket. Like, oh, we got to make sure we have our dynasty content taken care of. We got to make sure we have this, we have that. There's no category for what we do. So I would disagree with you on that. I think that, uh, A, that... uh, uh, I don't, I don't even know if I would listen because uh, this is my life and I don't want to do anything else. I didn't say you are going to sell it. But it would be nice to get the offer. I think that, that, that would be cool. That would be cool. But I, it, it's, it, I think that we're, we're a ways away 
from anyone in big media or anyone that that has capital, significant capital in this space, appreciating what we do. And you know what? And it's going to be in the outtakes, so you all can listen to the outtakes if you want to hear more about this. We talk about this more there but uh, for the podcast. But uh, one day, we're just going to keep grinding and grinding and grinding, and one day you're going to look up and – High profile people are talking about player profiler. It's going to happen. You're going to wake up one morning and it's going to start happening. And if it doesn't happen, I'm okay with that too, because we're doing great. Happy for you. And so are you, buddy. That's the show. So we did promise hours and hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> Hours and hours. We I just looked at the clock. Holy shit, it's two o'clock. I know. I'm pretty uh, sure I went right through a meeting. Unbelievable. So we gotta take a question from the audience. Oh fuck. I forgot about that. Yeah, we got we promised. We have to you always have to keep your promises you promise. to the to the stream. Uh so uh, let let's see. Um uh I'm, tr I'm looking. We, uh, I don't know. I don't know. John Anderson Rojo is not the answer. We know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th thanks, John. Thanks for that. That was a good contribution. I put that on the screen. Let's see. Any questions from the chat? Let's go. We got to get. We can't. We have to go pee, and we have to go eat. And we can't until one of you asks a goddamn question. Okay, here we go. This this looks good. What would Pittman and Higgins' stat lines next year have to be for you to take Pittman over Higgins in Dynasty? That's an interesting hypothetical. It would have um, to be a wide gap. There I mean, would, because... There's Pittman so much would have to with dominate Higgins. Higgins in 2022. I think I think there's a, a a I don't know if a good chance is the right word, but I think there's a very real chance that we see Pittman go off for like 1400, 1450 yards this year. Maybe the touchdowns aren't there, and we see T T Higgins continue to perpetually float around like the 1100 yard mark and never really excel past that. And I think the case could be made. Pittman kind of feels like, uh, I don't want to say like the perfect storm where this year is going to be massive for him, but his dynasty value never really hits like elite alpha level. Cause I think we're always going to be asking like, when is Indy going to add that second wide receiver? When is Indy going to add the other alpha on the side? And for Higgins, that's already there. And we know what he's giving us with that other alpha on the side with Pittman. They had one really good piece this year, and his dynasty value, I don't want to say it tanks because I still think he's a great player, but the fear of uncertainty will take up a lot of that gap if it's like 200 to 300 yards on the season. So I would say like yeah. Pittman needs to really pop off for that 1,450-yard mark while Higgins floats around what he did last year, if not even like pulls back a little bit. I would think, yeah, my, my thinking is you'd have to see some pullback from Higgins. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be something like Pittman 1,350, Higgins 1,100. That would be where they become two ships in the night. Because the age doesn't matter in Dynasty. They're both young enough where the age is irrelevant. One guy's an established alpha with an upgraded quarterback, has a monster season. The other guy is just the, the rhythm guitarist in the band if he's putting up 1,100 yards in that Bengals offense. At that point, in that context, you're like, yeah, okay, I'd rather have Pittman. Yeah, it's going to take a whole lot. I saw Cody right in the chat. 1,711 oh, to 1,206. On, you think Michael Pittman's going off for 1,700 Cody, yards? we're trying to be real here. You're fucking fired. Trying to come up with realistic scenarios, Cody. All right, everybody. Say goodbye. I got shit to do.